Hello, everyone. Welcome in to episode nine of City of Light and Shadow, a Fate French Resistance campaign. And I'm so glad to see you all. Um, yeah, this is our first solo episode, which I'm very, very, very excited about. Um, every single player gets their own solo episode, and I can talk about that and why and what that's all about in a second. But I want to give you the hello. This is the Academic Foxhole, and uh, we're running this show, and I want to thank you for being here, all of y'all. There are a bunch of different ways that you can support us if you want, and the first and the foremost is being here. So thank you for being here. You can also host the show on your channel. You can retweet that we are live, tell your friends to be, at, be over here, hang out. Those are things you can do. Uh, there are other things you can do to support this show. Uh, you can follow, which I think is a up there probably it's probably over there it's, you know there's a button you can uh, follow and uh, also uh, you, if you want to you can subscribe um, ooh thank you for uh, thank you for the the bits Rissa also I can say you cannot see rolls over there so let me make sure that you can um, let me see what else can I tell you uh, you can also if you like um, uh, I don't know. You can join our. We have a. We have a. We have a Discord. No, a Patreon. We have a Patreon. There's both. We Discord. yes. Yeah, there's everything. That, everything you want, we have. That is true. Uh, the Patreon goes specifically to help uh, support pay the cast and also for our overlay and our, and our custom theme song. Uh, if you give tips and bits, which you can, if you would like to, for example. As uh, Rissa just gave us uh, bits, I will read out any messages that you give us uh, at the mid break and then also at the end. And there's one more thing that you can do, although actually you sort of uh, can't anymore, just, just so you know. Uh, that is, uh, we're playing Fate and the ways in which the players can maybe make it so that they are less likely to have desperate problems uh, is to spend Fate points if they have aspects that will are relevant but our players don't have that many fate points um our rocket has one and that amuses me greatly uh but <laughs> no, no it shouldn't oh because she's gonna do great ish <laughs> mm. but what is exciting though is that as a as a resistance group they also have the ability to get support they have they have their own they get like their, their cell gets one 
on its own, but uh, the cell also has the opportunity to get support from London from the SOE, and the support from London comes in the form of you all. Uh, and to give support, all you need is to go and spend the extra credit, which we have uh, 5,000 extra credits, to give them uh, support from London, Vive la Resistance. And actually, I would, but it's limited to four, and all four have been gifted. And because I figure you want to see it, I would like to. Uh, now officially give one from Ice Bunny. Thank you, Ice Bunny. Thank you very much. One from Ephrithiel, who's made all of our amazing overlays uh, and our promos and is amazing. Rissa, who is my Call of Cthulhu GM and also super awesome. And also Beepy Phantom, who I like to call Beepy because that makes me really full of joy in my life. So I want to thank all four of you. Well, actually, maybe maybe I'm not the one who should thank you. Maybe I should turn it over to the person who's having the solo episode today to introduce herself and uh, to introduce her character and maybe to say thank you for now sitting at seven fate points. Yes, so um, I have questions about that, but, but I'll, I'll be getting to those soon enough. Um, hello, everybody. I am Rocket Fox. Um, I, I am here, there, everywhere. Um, you can find me wherever Rocket Foxes can be found on the social needs and everything like that. Um, that's right. Shockingly enough, uh, this is not B-52, but it, I expect it to be just as difficult. So. <laughs> but, it, but, but the question is, will it just be a love shack? Will you be able to roam if you want to? Like, I, I, well, you know, if Sylvie has her way, um, every place would be a love shack. <laughs> <laughs> would there, will there be a rock lobster? I mean, these are all the questions I, I know, have. But which brings me to, uh, I am playing the, the lovely jazz singer, Sylvie Moreau, who is, um, she is an American expat who's been living in Paris for 10 years. Um, she is a, again, she's a jazz singer, um, sassy lady, can't really keep her mouth to herself. Nope. In terms of being sassy, but also in terms of other things, evidently. Um, yeah, and, um, I guess which, well, we'll get, we'll get to that. We'll be getting to that. I'll, I'll stop. I'll stop all, you'll find out more so soon. <laughs> so, um, this is, I, I, oh, I, was, I told you I was going to tell you this. Uh, this is one of our solo episodes, and each, each character is going to have one. And when I first dreamed up this campaign in 1988, uh, and I started reading about the French resistance and the different resistances movements, generally speaking, all of them, World War II resistance movements, um, a bunch of first-person interviews. Um, one of the things that I thought that really struck me when reading these first-person interviews was um, the stress of doing the things you need to do solo. Because all of our uh, agents, they couldn't always work as a group. Sometimes they would have to do things on their own. They'd have to uh, get supplies. They'd have to move from one part of the city to the other. They might have to gather information. There are just things that you have to do just sometimes just getting across the city. Um, and when you do those things by yourself, you don't have your team members with you. And I remember reading these these accounts of uh, agents talking about the stress of doing these things on their own. And they also talked about <laughs> the stress of knowing that their compatriots were doing things on their own. And, um, never knowing if their compatriots had been captured or turned in the meantime when they were doing their their own solo things and these things could be anything from recruiting new members uh to running to see pick, picking up um picking up dead drop sort of notes places dropping off notes doing a radio broadcast all sorts of, you know, just uh, gathering information in ways that it wouldn't make sense for a group to do it, but only one person. Uh, and that the sort of this discussion of when they all had organized to meet together at a certain time, and they all arrive at that time, and one of the agents is not there. The question lingering, were they captured? Will we see them again? If we wait for them at this moment, will there be a phalanx of Nazi soldiers coming to get us because 
our friend has been captured and sold us out. Like that particular kind of paranoia about not just when you're alone, but when you're about to meet up again. And um, that is something I've always been very excited about. And here we have an entire session for Sylvie to do things on her own. And um, you know what's really exciting is that in chat are none of the other players right now. So they don't know what's going to be happening in this session. And we'll just have to wait next session to find out. Well, I mean, you all are going to find out this session along with everybody here, but they won't know. And I'm very excited. I'm very excited for that. So well, there's also no one to tell her no if if certain certain tasty, tasty options come up. <laughs> like fate point options where I might say to you, would you like a fate point to get into some trouble? Listen, I'm... <laughs> She, she has already been like, you know, it seems like a good idea right now. <laughs> so we shall see. It was hard enough for me to say no to a few things that were offered before. So that's what I like about you. You're like, yes, you're 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 not you're not a can't hey, do. You're a can do. I, I'm a yes and type of gal. <laughs> yes and. and and we'll see where that ends up taking. And and for everyone out there, we'll notice that. Um, Sylvie is is not as much the glitz and glam tonight. Mm -hmm. So um, mm -hmm. there are reasons for this. Which I love. I noticed right away that you were not in the big dress, and I'm very excited. Um, so let's talk about where we're at. The last session ended uh, with a birthday party. A birthday party of Jules, uh, your loyal bouncer, somebody who has saved you more than once, actually, multiple yes. times, multiple times, usually saving you from saying things that maybe you should not in situations that you should not. You know, circumstances, stuff, things. Circumstances. And that party went really well. Uh, it also culminated with a sort of very important um, action wherein the Nazis were about to go and execute the first of the prisoners that they were executing. Um, but, um, and they wanted everybody to see at the Arc de Triomphe, the sort of big deal. And instead of uh, everybody coming out, you put out the word, did a lot of work to try to make sure that the fewest number of people came out as possible. And at the moment of the um, execution, people started saying out the Marseille. Now, of course, you could not get the entire city to do it because not the entire. There are a lot of collaborators in the city, or people who just don't want to be involved, and you couldn't stop everybody from coming out to that um, execution. But you stopped a lot of people from coming out so much, and then of course you shot off uh, fireworks at this moment. And it was not everybody, but it was enough. It was enough that it looked not great. Uh, now, what I'm going to say is because you're here and the other players are not, this was, I would take this as an attack against them. I think that that was an attack against your opponents. And so I would like you to roll a propaganda attack from your faction. Uh, but I, I will. <laughs> mark off one of your factions stress, though. Um, oh, yes, I will. Um, let's... Oh, no. I have to decide for myself. You do have to decide for yourself. Mm. I'll take it off of reputation. That's good. Yeah, yeah. Because that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. All right. So that's propaganda attack. Mm -hmm. And here we go. Real good. A one. That is a one. Do you want to do anything to boost that with the many fate points that your group has? Well, what am I up against? Or is it just a straight well, up attack? Um, what? I, I will roll it. They they have a four of propaganda, by the way, because they're very good at propagandaing. So it's going to be this plus a four. So a three. Ooh, so I could tie it. You could tie it. Is what I'm hearing. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and we have how many over here? Oh, we've got a bunch. I am going to go ahead and tie it. Mm -hmm. Now here's uh, and my, my reasoning is thus. <clears throat> As a jazz establishment, an establishment that 
gives the people a sense of spirit of music and as a place where a lot of um non-citizens tend to gather yep um it's a place where we tend to build a lot of morale mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and i would say a lot of the people in their times of stress um have have frequented our humble establishment mm -hmm. and i would say that you know people who are feeling a little more connected to the arts there i'm going to go ahead and say it are maybe people who would be more likely to have been some of those people out there singing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i think you're using your uh your high concept i think so hi safe house preservation for the future yeah mm -hmm. so uh can you delete one of those fate points for Preserving me Preserving the culture i can i'll weep but i can it's gone thank there. you that would bring you up to a tie so here's my question do you want to spend one more oh <sighs> remind me that would give uh, that would give them two stress well so yes so right now you wouldn't you wouldn't give them any stress but they would you would get a boost against them but if you spent one more fate point then you would um do two stress to them and because it succeed with a style you would also you could you could you have a choice of whether either you're doing two stress to them or do one stress and get a boost mm. yeah i'll use one more and i'll get it, give them a stress and take a boost what's the justification my justification on that mm -hmm. is because we were also the force behind the fireworks. Mm -hmm. um, that was what my other thing here. Very, that was a very direct uh, statement. Um, that I think um, would show. Where's my other? I'm getting rid of my extra fate points because I don't get four. I only get one per seat. Um, I mean, honestly, can I? I know it's a trouble, but I feel like you know, it. <laughs> it I think that goes under passion for the cause. Like, if that yes. is a very risky yes. maneuver. Yes. That was a super risky yes. maneuver, but like, yeah. I mean, that is some passion to have her in, like, yeah. But moments, yeah. put together fireworks, go out and shoot them from the middle of the city. Yes, uh, that warming with Nazis, like that's nuts. Yes, I would agree. Uh, it is your trouble aspect, but I think it certainly counts. If you would um, spend, uh, if you would like to spend one more, that would be great. So let's see. I think that you are dinging their reputation. I think so. Mm hmm. Uh, would you like to spend one and get a boost or two? Would you like to do one stress to them and get a boost or two? Uh, one stress and a boost. Please. They sadly, for them, not for you, um, mm -hmm. have already filled in their one reputation box, so they have to fill in their two reputation box, their two reputation stress box anyway. So. Oh. oh. Yes. So you're going to get a boost, and that boost is going to be. Let's call it. Um, uh, I think your boost is, how about something like uh, the Nazis are on edge? I think that seems good. Right? Or, or um, they, they need a friend. <laughs> they're, dis they're distracted at the moment. There's a lot going on for them. <laughs> That's... I, think, I think that deserves a celebratory bite of chocolate. Ooh, actual chocolate from, like not from fake chocolate? Land. <sighs> and so we will, uh, oh, we should say the last thing that happened. Yes. Mm, yes. While this party was going on, uh, your head of the Gestapo friend stopped by the club, but you were not there for it. He did not stay long. He listened to some jazz from the band. Uh, it was a little sad not to see you perform, but I suppose you kept me performing all the time. Uh, but he did not stay You're a busy long. one. You're a busy one. You, however, were downstairs um, in the your sort of downstairs room, 
that has been your sort of base, your safe room, your basement. And on the dressing table that has sort of now been used as what your your safe room is now sort of looking like a sort of a makeshift triage unit, like a sort of a medical unit. And on this table there was a file, a manila envelope with your name written in Regina's hand. And when you'd opened it up, there was a photograph of a file. It's clear that uh, Regina has gotten rid of all the files that they had, but has photographed everything uh, and probably hid those hid those uh, negatives somewhere so that she can print as she needs, but they're much easier to hide than like a hole. She probably swallowed them, knowing her. <laughs> <laughs> swallowed them. Oh. <laughs> what? Uh, but it is a transfer notice that one Dimitri Bergson was being transferred from a work camp out east back to this place, Drancy. This place, Drancy, that you've been hearing about. Um, so, side note, people in chat, uh, we are currently in May of 1941, and Drancy does not come online in actual history as a uh, transit camp until a little bit later this year, but we're having them open up a little bit early. They're sort of in their process. They're still kind of young in it. Um, but you've heard they're, about... They're beta running it. They're beta running it. Uh, and you know Drancy is the place where they brought the 3,700 uh, foreign Jews that were just rounded up last night uh, that they you had heard that they're being sent there. Uh, and Drancy should be a transit camp is what they call it. It's a concentration camp, but it's where they hold people until they can ship them off somewhere east. It is not a place where people stay permanently, more or less. Um, so, right, it's a place where people are there only as long as they can be then taken somewhere probably much less pleasant. So it's a little bit odd that Dimitri is being brought from one of those places that you're sent more permanently back to this transit camp. But the order was signed by Falke himself, the now dearly departed Falke, who I think no one's really um, all of that uh, worried about. And so you have this folder the night of Thursday the 15th. What do you do as the party's going on upstairs? Um, well, I, I think Sylvie wouldn't make um, her move really uh, until until after the party has officially wound down. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think she'd want to set anyone off um, necessarily, but this is a very personal matter. Um, I think she has some ideas of people that uh, might be able to get her closer. Um, so, that being said, uh, after the party has wound down, yep. um, she is going to carry on as if everything is normal and, uh, you know, head back to the apartment and, you Probably know. Probably also with Tango. With Tango. Um, but then probably in the, uh, in the evening... Oh, it's uh, it's and by because this your party your your club does not close until super late. Well, listen, evening is probably around like five thirty a.m. Let's oh, be real. Oh, like, I see, I see. Evening, like, go on. I, I I meant evening for Sylvie Park. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, I I understand this evening, right? Yeah, because it's not the next day until you go to sleep. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, you you follow where I'm coming from. I do. Um, I do. So she's going to jot down a quick note, um, just saying that she went out on an errand, not to worry. Um, and she is going to don something a little more subtle, mm -hmm. um, some actual uh, more work type clothes. Mm -hmm. um, and she is going to head out of the apartment. Um, and 
she is going to see so she knows a lot of people in a lot of places and she's going to see if she can think get in touch with anyone who like near that district who might have something to do with either having flipped the locale over to its current process or who might be working in it um, as help, hired help, something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Something along those, because she's not exactly sure what specifically they're doing, but she knows that like there's some sort of role there that like the Germans are not filling. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so she's going to try and reach out through her her creepy fingers to uh, see if she can reach out to anyone. Very good thought. Before we get there, two things. Uh -huh. Two things. You're yeah. out there on the street at like 5.30 in the morning. That's correct. And it's Friday morning. It's a new day. Um, it is May. It's still cold because it's 5.30, right? There's like sort of the... And it's, you know, um, if you've ever... <laughs> There are two types of people, I think, who are out in the street at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, they're the people who have gone to bed at, I don't know, what kind of insane time, like 7. Who knows what, I don't know what they're doing. Uh, and then they wake up, you know, a full 8 or 9 or 10 hours later, uh, refreshed to go out on the, to go out to work. There are some people that are sort of getting ready that, you know, not many people, because it's pretty early. Um, but there are a couple of people that are sort of moving on the street. And then there are the people who have not gone to bed yet. Um, she may have slept like an hour and a half, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> but this early in the morning, there are a couple of things that you notice. Um, you notice the smell of baked goods. Because it's 5.30 in the morning and the bakeries, those that still have things to sell, um, are baking. And you can smell the smell of croissant and bread uh, fresh in the morning. In many of the bakeries that are doing this, uh, you have are are bakeries that have had like sort of German signs plastered over, so where they're going to be expected to be serving German soldiers mostly. But there are sort of people beginning to sort of set up, and as you're walking through the streets, you can see a, a few um, stalls being set up with like early stalls like with maybe some fruits and vegetables but there are some german soldiers on the streets watching over them because nothing can be gotten without um ration cards of course at the moment um so you're seeing the sort of the the beginning of of the city waking up uh and at, with a new day it's a new time and you're oh my goodness yep yeah, you're uh you're gonna make make a defense. You're um, somewhere in this city. Somebody's asking some questions, and this is uh, someone's being asked pleasant, pleasant questions. Uh, that is a terrible roll. Uh, that's fantastic. A, that's a two. But I'm I'm going to. Do I want to spend one of my fate points? No. No, that seems silly. I only have one, and I might need it for something more important later. Yeah, that, I, I would... Uh, well, wait, hang on a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I want to have happen here. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to go with a two. Uh, there's a two. I, I need you to make some kind of a... I need you to make a, a defense of your, I think, deflection. Um. Because someone's asking questions. We... Oui. Go. Good roll. Okay. Um, you're down by two. Hmm. I see this. What yes. would you like to do about that? Um, let's go ahead and uh Okay. This is this is for everyone. Mm -hmm. So I'll I'll um I'll, uh, I'll use one. I get well. Uh, how many do we have in here? You've got five. Have um, yeah, I'll use I'll use one to reroll. Just, just uh oh, you want to reroll? What did you roll? How how, how, I, how? Well, I I haven't yet, but I want to. 
Yeah, that was not a very good roll. Um, it was not. It was bad. You it have your choice. Bad. You can either get the plus two, which will tie you, or you can reroll. I might try rerolling. All right. Give me the justification. Um, what, what of your aspects will allow you to uh, resist that people? Uh, you actually, you have your, you have your, you have your boost, which you could spend. Um. Actually, yeah. Let me do that. So you don't have to spend a fate point. Yeah, let me do that for now. They're, they're just, you know, after what happened last night, they're a little off their game. They're a little off their questioning game. That is correct. Um, you don't know, but somewhere across the town, Jeanette is being questioned for another day. It's another day where she's being questioned and she's not slept. And they're asking her questions over and over and over again. <sighs> And that's a tie, which means they get a boost on you. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. But you don't take any stress or consequences. I'll take it. So, what are you looking for? You're looking for people who might, who might have worked there or be part, because you know that this place, Drancy, has gone through some massive... Um, reworking recently in order to make themselves ready um yeah. ready for for the whatever's happening there right now and so you okay. figured someone must know so i'm going to need um a a contacts role from you all right and here we go three Ooh. uh three is Come very good three is very good um so you you know a lot of people you know a lot of people in really different places do you have a specialization on your contacts i do not all right i'm just curious if you did um i do know that my fans however range from high and low places this is correct i imagine my contacts probably very <laughs> as, wide well. as well um, I will say that you can um, specialize your contacts if you want to. You can you can okay. think about that. Uh, so you can think about like uh, with whom do you, are you just a little bit extra better contacted if you if you like. Um, but you're thinking thinking about this. Uh, a lot of people come through your club, and you're thinking about who might be sort of the best people to get in contact with. Who might you know? And you think to yourself. All right, there are a couple of options. There's clearly construction that must have happened. So some kind of construction worker might be useful. But also, if there are a lot of people, they're clearly people who clean the facility. That's that's kind of what I was thinking. Because if there are cleaners that maybe come in and out-ish, um, maybe I can slip in. <laughs> yes. And the thing is, when it comes to cleaners, you cleaners don't always come to your bar right i mean your bar is a little nicer i mean it's not like the moulin rouge or anything like that it's a it's a tad divier than that but um it, you know it's not it's not it's not a dive bar but people from the neighborhood sometimes you have these locals that will sometimes uh come around and visit and you do remember that there, do you remember a, sort of a couple of women? There's a woman that you're like, oh, I do remember her. Uh, she was uh, a Natalie, um, pardon me, uh, Deborah Chavot. Uh, and she, you remember that she is like a, she's been a cleaning lady for a long time. Uh, she worked for the French government at one point in time before the invasion. She like, she cleaned government offices and things like that. And and she's she's one of those people, she's one of those women who's been cleaning most of her life and she's no longer young. So she knows she probably knows everyone, right, in this in this scene, if there is anyone to know. And so Deborah is the person that you think that if there was somebody that you would want to talk to, she who would know something, she would probably be the one who would know something. And you also know because uh you rolled very well. Uh, you know where she gets her uh, morning food. 
Uh, it's early. You figure at this point in time in the morning, she's probably out and about. And there's a cafe. Uh, there's a cafe where a number of the of like people who like cleaners um, and uh, workers like that have a particular cafe where they go to and nowadays they're not smoking they're not getting actual cafe they're getting coffee they're getting that kind of terrible fake mm -hmm. coffee but you know a place where they tend to go it's a it's a little it's like a sort of like a half a halfway part between a um, like a bakery and a, and a cafe that where early morning people can go and get their coffee um, and uh, also right get uh, maybe a little bit of uh, a little bit of baguette uh, but it's also it's also pretty cheap it's like not a, it's a it's a pretty cheap cheap place so that people who don't have a lot of money can also go and get it and you figure if there's any place where you would find her, you would find her there. Mm. Well, that seems like a place that I want to go. Mm -hmm. You make your way across the city. Um, and as you are traveling across the city, um, there are a couple. Of, give me give me an awareness is what I would like. You know, that's something that I've always been meaning to add. Yeah. I just haven't done it. Not yet. You know, you've got things in your life. Zero. All right. Not not super aware right now. You've got things on your mind, I imagine. I'm also probably very sleepy. And you're probably also very sleepy. This is yeah. This is this is not a, a normal time for anyone. As you see, as people work moving on to work, and uh, you're sort of maybe a little bit sleepy. And then all of a sudden, from behind you, you hear, "Achtung, Mademoiselle." Yes. And when you turn, there are two German military soldiers, and they have stopped you. And you notice there are a lot of German soldiers on the streets right now. Uh, there are Nazis everywhere at this moment. And it's that thing you hadn't really noticed it, you weren't really paying attention, but now that you've been stopped and you see that there's not just one patrol, there's also one on the other side of the street. Um, and there are a couple of, um, like sort of, what do you call them? Um, not, I think blockade's the wrong word, although maybe it's not. What do you call it when, um, uh, the police set up a, like a stop? Like that's a blockade. It's a blockade, right? And yeah. Yeah. And like, you notice a blockade here or there where they're just checking people. It seems like everybody's on high alert. Checkpoint. Mm -hmm. Thank you, people Checkpoint. in chat. Checkpoint. Yes. Checkpoint. Thank you. That is the word that I was looking for. Um. <laughs> You all have been doing a lot of things recently that have upset people and have made them feel threatened. Uh, that display last night was mm. obvious. It was challenging. It mm. was it was an attack. These are words. These are words. Also, <laughs> the head of military intelligence was assassinated. Uh, that is that is true. That is a very threatening thing. And his intelligence files stolen. That was something that someone did that was not me. They don't know who it was, but they're interested to find out. And they had this amazing coup. They were going to steal the Mona Lisa. It does not seem that they have... They've, there's a lot of things that they're quite concerned about at this moment. Things are clearly happening. Uh, they're not. They're not excited. So it seems life's as hard. yeah, life is hard for them. So it seems as if they're a little bit more on edge, and things are a little bit tighter in their security. Also, they have a lot of extra security because they just rounded up almost four thousand people. So they had a lot of extra troops in the area. Hmm. And these two Germans, um, they stop you, and they look a little. Uh, a little tired, a little young, uh, a little on edge. One of them, uh, the one who's sort of standing a little bit back, has got his rifle on alert in a way that he probably shouldn't because that's not necessarily safe. Um, he's not pointing it at you, but he's clearly tense, right? He's clearly uh, on edge. And there's another one who's standing forward who approaches you and he goes, your papers, please. Um, yes, of course. He looks at your papers. Now, these papers, which papers do you hand him? I hand him... Because I believe that Tango made you all fake papers. 
I believe so. Mm -hmm. And I would like to hand the I'm going to hand the real papers. You hand him the real papers. All right. You hand him these real papers, and he looks at them. And he sort of checks them over. And he checks the stamps on them to make sure the stamps are up to date. And he looks at them. He looks at you. He looks at them. Then he says, may I see your ration cards? Of course. Do you hand him real ration cards or fake ration cards? I'll hand him the real ones. He looks at them. He makes sure that the stamps are the most recent stamps because they change them quite often. He looks at you. He looks at the stamps. The other guard behind seems just sort of fingers the trigger on the rifle and starts to walk a little bit to the side just to make sure that he's got all of the angles just in case. And the guard looks at both... And he's about to hand them back to you as you're yawning in the early morning. And he says, Mademoiselle Moreau? Oui. What are you doing out this early in the morning? I am getting an early little bit of uh, coffee and breakfast. looks at you, trying to assess your honesty here. Can I get a deception roll? I mean, it's true that you're going to do that, but you've got other things on your mind. <laughs> it, it, it is very early, is it not? It is. Do you want to spend a fate point? Not yet. Okay. Um, he looks at you and he goes, one moment. And he turns to the, the younger guy who's a little on edge. And they have a brief conversation in German, sort of hushed, and you don't know exactly what it is. And the other guy sort of nods at what this first man says. And he um, just points the rifle toward you, but toward the ground. But instead of sort of out here on the side, it's just a little bit more this way. And the one who's talking to you makes a gesture, just he makes a gesture at some of the soldiers on the other end of the street. They don't come over, but they're watching. So now there are about four Nazi guards just looking at you. And the one in front says, could you tell me what you were doing last night, uh, last evening, around six o'clock. Oh, sir, I, I didn't realize. I'm so sorry. I'm so tired. I didn't realize. Are you a fan? I, I'm so sorry. Oh, we, we get so many soldiers through the club. Um, you, what's your name? Have I met you before? Um, I'm going to need from you contacts. Ooh. <laughs> uh-huh. And he says, I do not know what you're speaking of. And the, the guard behind, who's got his sort of gun sort of trained at your feet, um, just says, <clears throat> Zisty Singerin. And it's the brick tops. The guy goes, "Was? This the jazz singerin? This Sylvie Moreau jazz singerin?" And you, can... I, I knew I recognized you. You are so handsome. I never forget a handsome face. Mm. Oh, your your name. Oh, it starts with um. Oh, help me out. I'm. I haven't slept. We had a late show last night. Um. Starts with a um, a C. No, um. and the the guy in the back sort of shakes his head, a little embarrassed. Oh goodness! Um, 
I'm so sorry, love. I don't Con remember your Con name. Conrad. Conrad. This a K. A K, of course, of course. It is so much more charming when it's spelled with a K, you know. <laughs> and the first guard who's doing the talking is like, what what is this? Like he's a little he's like, what what is what is going on here in this situation? He's not particularly excited about this conversation happening because he's got business to do. Um, I need a rapport for you and young Conrad. <laughs> oh, mm-hmm. And uh Yes. And so oh, oh, Conrad, uh, you. <laughs> and he just gets like a little uh, and you can tell now that the nervousness that he has, that kind of nervousness he's been e exhibiting this whole time is because he's kind of a fan and he doesn't really quite know what to do. And it's just like, uh, <laughs> you know, like it's like a, and like, oh, it's a little, oh, Conrad, I knew I recognized you. I never forget a handsome face. I apologies. And you, sir, what what is your name? It's not important. Oh, not important. That's such a funny name. <laughs> and Conrad laughs. <laughs> and I'm, this... I'm I'm kidding, of course. I I do apologize. We had as to answer your uh, question, we had a show last night. Um I yes, I um I own Brick Tops and I'm the uh the singer there and um, the uh, owner of the establishment. And I am I play there every night. We open at six, so I'm on stage promptly at six. And Conrad's like, it's true. It's She is, she's at every six o'clock. And he just looks at, at Conrad, like, why are you talking, right? Because Conrad is clearly not in charge here, but Conrad is talking and this man does not like it. <laughs> uh, but Conrad's like, no, no, she does. She sings at six o'clock every evening, but not on Mondays. Mondays is the day off. That's true. Conrad, you, she kind of like, kind of scooches past us. Like, Conrad, you come by any time and I will make sure you have a drink in your hand. Oh, oh, oh. Um, you just ask for me and I will come down and see you personally. <laughs> and he's clearly trying to work. Okay, you can see on his face, conflict. There's conflict on his face. Um, and the conflict seems to be between you and his boss, and you're not quite certain where that con what it what's all going on there. But there's he's clearly conflicted. Like there's it's like there's this sort of anxiousness, like he wants to do something or say something, but he doesn't think he can. And so there's this like real um, there's a lot of tension of like almost wanting to like because you just step close to him, and then you're like right there in front of his face. And and he's like in a state of like he's he's basically fanboying out with you being actually so close and offering him a drink, but his boss is and there. And then I'll I'll on the side that his boss is not. I'll wink, and then I'll kind of turn back over to the to the boss, <laughs> boss man. Um, so uh, not important. Uh, tell him, Sar Sergeant, is it Sergeant not important or Captain not important? <laughs> it's uh, Staff you Sergeant. See Captain Sergeant. The staff Sergeant. Staff Sergeant. I'm sorry. When I'm tired, my hearing is the first thing to go. Um, but you, you know, you seem like you're very important. And I like that about you. Look. You, know, you should come die sometime too. We are a very welcoming place. Let me just ask you one more question. And oh. then Conrad just sort of goes, don't you think we could let her go? She clearly wasn't involved in anything last night, and she was on the show. And uh, I mean, certainly we, we don't have to keep her any longer. Uh, she she probably wants to get a coffee or something, or maybe a, a brioche or something like this. Uh, and this staff sergeant just gives this withering look <laughs> at, at this private and says, very well, if you were performing all night, then you clearly were not involved in these things that was happening last night. Wait. And he stops. Clearly has got you now. And he says, What song did you sing last night? And this is clearly his like big gotcha moment. He's clearly caught you, and there's no way you're gonna get out of this expert questioning that he's given you. <laughs> What? Staff Sergeant, I sang St. Louis Blues. It is my bouncer's favorite. My entire staff was there. We had a little bit of a birthday party. We were all there the entire night. It was wonderful. Uh, you know, these days, it's a little hard to get together for our celebrations, but I think we really made something special happen. 
Now, as you can tell, he was clearly trying to interrogate you, but he is not an interrogator. And his like big gotcha question, where he's gonna ask you what you sang, and then you were gonna say the Marseillaise and he'd get you, and then you didn't, so he's sort of a little bit at a loss, uh, because you didn't, I don't know, just admit that you were doing the <laughs> stuff. And, and, and Conrad is like, we have to go. We're gonna be late for the next checkpoint. Uh, Staff Sergeant. Mm -hmm. and, he, and the Staff Sergeant just looks at him and goes, Well, all right. And he hands you back your papers. Thank you. Carry on. Make your way. Keep your head down. And he, he this, this officer, starts to turn. And the younger man, Conrad, just, he just goes to turn and he, and he, he, he goes, like this, it's just with this little, right when his boss is not looking, right? He just kind of <laughs> gives this little wave. And you can tell that he wants to ask you something, but he knows he can't, right? But you like you can tell there's a question on his lips the entire time. His boss is right there. And, and it's this, um, you see this like look of yearning, like this is my chance to ask you something right here in person. And I can't. And it's like this real sadness as he's like basically drawn away from like this basically this cool celebrity that I don't know. He maybe could have asked for your autograph or something, but there's no way that was going to happen. And you see him <laughs> sort of move away from you uh, with his staff sergeant um, a little bit sadly. And the staff sergeant sort of signals to the the German soldiers on the other side of the street. And they I'm just going to wave to them, too. And they just sort of nod, but they don't stop you because you have clearly been waved through as you um, are, are free to move <laughs> move on towards this small, uh, small uh, cafe, sort of uh, cafe slash um, uh, bakery, like a little, you know, it gets a little boulangerie. Whew. And as you go through there, you're stopped like three or four more times as you sort of make your way, because this particular place where she, she frequents is not in your neighborhood, it's not in your uh, district. So you have to sort of go through a couple of districts as you're on your way there. Um, and as you pass through um, towards this direction, you're actually going, um, moving out a little bit to the side. You're not too far, because uh, Montparnasse is, uh, if, here, I can, I can show you all people who are, interested in uh this here let me show you uh montparnasse is uh actually convenient for you actually uh, in terms of um um uh, you're you're in montmartre which is yes. Uh, yes up here montparnasse used to be hip in the 19th century but uh, in the jazz age it's it's montmartre so montmartre is right up here it's it's this one I think you all can see it. Uh, and it's still hip today. <laughs> it is still hip today. And actually, that is on the northernmost part of Paris, which is closer to Drancy, which is because uh, Drancy is just a little bit further up this way, which is uh, why you you know, like you're more likely to know somebody who would have worked up there. And you make your way to the northern edge of uh, Mont. Uh, Montmartre, and there's a little, little cafe, and you sort of just pass through, and you see, of course, signs, a lot of propaganda signs uh, up there, sort of anti-resistance, anti-collaborationists, uh, uh, anti-resistance, anti right, anti, sort of anti um, and sort of uh, signs with, like, Germans and the Vichy shaking hands and smiling, and you've sort of got this everywhere. Uh. And, you know, like friendship, signs about like friendship and getting along and not rocking the boat. Uh, and of course, of course, it sounds so good on paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, you would guess, by the way, that this soldier, Conrad, was probably 18 is what you would guess. He's he looked like such a little baby. <laughs> yeah, he was a youngin. Um, and. As you make it to this little cafe, you 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 notice it before you get close, because up front, out of this cafe, there is uh, a gaggle of workers, 
there's just like 15 or 20 um mostly um mostly women um and it's a sort of it's a funny it's a funny demographic because uh Vichy has passed laws saying that if you that if you as a woman have a husband who can take care of you financially you are not allowed to work because they're pushing the um women should be staying home having children thing like they're Fantastic. yeah they're they they have and they have pass laws to make it more difficult for women uh, to exist now that it, it is Vichy. Uh, and thank you for the host, Grim. And so what you see, you see women who are too young to be married, and you see women whose husbands are probably dead. Um, it's that sort of that sort of bifurcation of age. So you've got like uh, 18, 19 year olds, and you've got these women who are 50. Um, and that's like, you've got very little in between a little smattering here or there, but for the most part, um, it's right. It's this sort of interesting sort of mix. Um, but you do see, uh, you do see your friend. Well, this woman that, you know, um, my, my future friend. Yes. Uh, and you, the thing is you've seen her before and you've seen her before in the club. Um, and, uh, she's, uh, uh, Muriel, Muriel, and Muriel is a woman in her um, late thirties, early forties. Although she looks a little bit older because she's clearly had a very hard life, um, and she clearly has smoked a lot and has probably also drunk a lot in her life. Uh, and you know she's drunk a lot because she's been in your bar and you 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 have seen her drinking. Maybe have encouraged that. I don't know. <laughs> yes, um, and. They were, uh, and they were, uh, and strike, by the way, it was the Vichy French who made these laws about the natalism. So that's like, it's, it's all around. And she's, uh, she's this woman who she has got super strong. She's got like, she's built, right? She's got these shoulders, uh, and these forearms and she, um, uh, she's a woman who has clearly worked her whole life. Um, uh, and um, she has got the kind of like the rough hands of somebody who's who's probably scrubbed floors right for for years, um, and she's there with some friends, uh, well or coworkers at least. There, right in this in this morning gaggle of people. I will approach, and most people don't pay much attention to you. And as you um, walk in to this sort of uh, uh, gaggle, um, you see um, on the wall some posters of Pétain, who's the um, the president of Vichy, France. Uh, this is the occupied, right? This is the north of France, which is occupied by the Nazis. But there's still this sort of veneer, right? A lot of the, um, uh, basically, a lot of the, the uh, Vichy France laws still are in effect in this moment. So for example, you're not allowed to execute women, French citizens. Uh, you're not allowed to execute French women by hanging or shooting in France. That's not appropriate. Um, and the even in the German occupied territory, they honor that <laughs> by just shipping you outside of the French territories and then executing you there. Um, hey. hey, there are ways around everything. Bureaucracy. Oh, yeah. Right. Yes. And um, you see, it's an interesting mix of, of, of women. These are these are cleaners, right? So you've got uh, women who are clearly, there's some women who seem to be uh, maybe Polish. There's some women who seem to be uh, Armenian. There seem to be some women who seem to be um, Spaniards, um, like there's like, and then of course, uh, lots of sort of a, a white French people as well, but it's a bit of a mix. There's some people, um, from the French colonies, uh, probably Martinique as well, maybe Morocco. So it's a kind of a, a bit of a mix of people who are doing this sort of heavy labor and they're all around and all of them clearly want to be smoking, but they can't be. Um, but instead, so instead they're drinking this weak, uh, coffee made out of not coffee, um, and sort of, you know, uh, chicory and having sort of like a small roll as they're all sort of sitting about. And it's, it's a little, uh, what's interesting is that you've, 
this is not your world, but you know lots of spaces. And you know that in times like this, people are usually talking and maybe gossiping and maybe somebody would be laughing about something and there'd be some kind of story about, you know, this or that. But nobody's talking. It's pretty somber, actually. It's pretty quiet. There might be some very hushed conversations, but it's as if, as if uh, sort of a blanket of paranoia has settled on the city and everyone's a little bit quiet as you are, as you approach. So I'm going to, I'm going to get one of these delicious coffees and a little roll myself. Hey, and then once I have obtained said items, I, I will approach Muriel. She sees you. And uh, can I just, is, is there anywhere to sit near her? These are, they're all standing. Everybody's they're standing. They're all Perfect. standing on like little, they've got these Even little better. tables out. I, I will uh, approach over and um, see if she says anything first. I won't wait super long. Sylvie would never do that. She'll wait as long as she can. Um, she sees you and she seems a little taken aback by seeing you here. And then she also sees what you're wearing, and then she's doubly taken aback, and she she's she's a little um, she doesn't quite know what to say. You can tell. Hello, my dear. So interesting to see you here. How are you? Uh, oh, um, I, I'm 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 fine. What? It's nice to see you, uh, Mademoiselle Moreau. Um, and she, you can tell that she's, there's a bit of a, um, there's like interesting politics here in terms of status. Um, you are a foreigner, which gives her more status, but she's a cleaner and you're a club owner, which gives you more status. And so there's this kind of awkwardness about, she's not quite certain how to address you or, or how to deal with you in this moment. Um, can I get a rapport role? I think. I will. Three. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Go on. And she's sort of waiting for you. Uh, I just came down to get a delicious cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, and by the way, you you have a boost on her. Um, you have a little boost on, on Muriel, uh, and it is that, uh, that you, that, um, she, you have been warm to her, right? Mm -hmm. Like you've, you've treated her like a human and that is, uh, a boost. Perfect. That makes me sad, but you know. That makes me happy. <laughs> <laughs> um. And she says, um, uh, what, um, what are you doing here, mademoiselle? I actually came to find you. Oh, uh, oh. Do you have a moment? Um, well, uh, of course, of course. Um, and she sort of nods to her friends and she sort of leads you to like the other end, like not the front part of the cafe where everybody's sort of eating and drinking before. Uh, and as you sort of move around the side, you notice that you see it. On the other side of the cafe, there's a um, a, a bus, um, sort of like a, a, a bus that is clearly probably um, not like a city bus, but like a transport bus, probably um, to take them to work. So is she, and she, she is a citizen, is she? Mm -hmm. What's her background? Would I be able to tell? She seems to be uh, a mostly a white French woman, as far as you can tell. Um, mm -hmm. That seems to be the case with her. Um, you, she's she's not obviously uh, either an immigrant or from a colony. Okay. Um. But her accent um, is a rough working class accent. Sure. 
Oh, things have been things have been interesting uh, since the Germans arrived. No. Uh, oui, oui. Um, what what are you doing here? I. You've been coming out to the club for a long time, and uh, you know we've we've talked here and there, and I've always enjoyed seeing you. You've always been very forthcoming and honest. I need a little bit of information, and I was curious if I might be able to ask you something. So, uh, okay. And she, and like, you can just tell, like her fingers rub in that way where she wishes she had a cigarette, right? Like <laughs> you, you can just tell, right, mm -hmm. uh, that she wishes she had a cigarette uh, in this sort of little slight moment of tension. Do you know anything about, ah, remind me of the name. The... Drancy. Drancy? Drancy, like Nancy, but with a DR. Ah, yes. Do you know anything about Drancy? Why, why, why do you ask? I, I have a friend. I have someone I care about very much that I'm, I'm trying to find out some information about. And oh. with everything that's been happening, I, and I say this because I feel like I can trust you. I'm, I'm just trying to find out some information, that's all. Oh, um, we are, I, I'm, I'm working there today. And she kind of just lets that hang in the air. Yeah. So we're going to reach out and, and touch your arm. Muriel, do you think you can get me in? You would never want to go there. It's terrible. I know. Why? I don't think that I would be able to live with myself if I knew this person was this close and I didn't at least try. And believe it or not, I, uh, I haven't always sung on stage. I'm sorry. You're too beautiful for me to believe you've done anything but sing your whole life. <laughs> well, I definitely will take that to heart, but that has been a lot of uh, Paris's blessings. <laughs> and she looks around. What I, I would need something in return. It's it's very dangerous. Of course. Um, what if I could get you a good pack of cigarettes? Ten. It will be done. Okay. Stay here. And she goes off. And you see her go into this crowd of, of women. And you see her go up to someone you hadn't actually seen before. And it's um, a woman who's uh, Southeast Asian. Maybe uh, uh, French into China. Uh, something along, right, that, right, one of the, the, the um, colonies, that, the places that France has invaded and colonized in Asia. And you see her talking to this woman who doesn't look really like you, but she's Asian. Uh, quite different, that, to be honest. That's all it takes sometimes. But that's all it takes sometimes. Um, I mean, for you, of course, you look nothing alike, um, right? I mean... 
you look nothing alike, but, and they're having a conversation and this woman sort of, um, uh, kind of shakes her head a little bit and like they have a bit of a conversation back and forth and then muriel makes this gesture with her hand which seems to indicate cigarettes and they talk a little bit about it, and they're like there's these numbers are going back and you see muriel sort of make this gesture of five and the woman and cigarettes are kind of worth a lot of money on the black market depending right good cigarettes and this woman thinks about it and they just sort of walk off a little bit from the rest of the crowd and you see this woman pass her some papers and leave just walk away away from this crowd and then muriel comes back to you and she says ten Ten. And she just passes you a passbook um, identification. It's got all the stamps. It's got, it's got, it's an ID, but it's also a work pass card uh, saying that you are working at Drancy, and you are. This is not you, uh, but it is uh, close enough for people who are probably racist. Um, and that, hey, that seems to fit where we're going. Yeah, and. Uh, and also for somebody who's just the help, right? Like there's all of that in there. And she says, I need this back when you're done because if not, she'll get in trouble. Of course, yes. I will not have anybody getting in trouble. Okay, well. And she looks concerned and you don't know what she's concerned about, but she has this sort of look. What she, is it? She says, well, stay close to me unless you have to go somewhere. And, and she just like reaches out and squeezes your hand. And she says, just prepare yourself. I shall. And she'll like guide you back into right this gaggle. And sometimes people look, but you made a very good contact role and very good rapport. So like your roles, this is all the result of all of those roles together. Um, and some people kind of give her a look and they kind of give you a look. And she just like, she just does this thing when somebody's about to say something, she just goes, <clears throat> it's like, say nothing. And everybody sort of just stays quiet again. And it's not too long when you hear their voices, the voices of the guards. But they're not German voices. They're French. Uh, the Paris French police, the gendarmerie, um, are all sort of roll up. And they start sort of shouting, right? All right, ladies, in the van. And slowly, as if like you're going into uh, like a factory or something, these women all sort of slowly trudge onto this this bus. And it's not German soldiers here. And it's a moment where you're thinking to yourself, perhaps, um, okay, French gendarmerie, this might be interesting because... Germans don't know French accents as well as French know French accents. Just a thing. And you well, maybe the heart's beating a little bit. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and as you one by one come on to this bus, the gendarme asks, um, "May I have your papers?" and looks at the papers from each one and sort of looks back and forth. And it's a long line of people. Um, it's like, it's a, um, it's a, a long line of people. Um, and you can see it's, uh, again, everybody is on edge a little bit, the gendarmerie. And that's got like a, a, a weird vibe, tensions a little high. Uh, and one by one, this, Gendarme sort of looks 
It says uh, papers, looks, looks. Next one. Next. Work card, papers. And I'll have uh, tucked my hair up under my... Uh, m- my scarf. Mm-hmm. Help, uh, help the illusion. And he comes, and when you get to the van, I assume you do. Um, uh, your papers, mademoiselle? Work card? I'm going to need deception from you. Sitting at a three. You're at a three. Um, That's a tie, which means you can succeed at a minor cost, or you can fail but gain a boost, or only partially succeed. I'll succeed at a minor cost. Okay. He takes your papers and he looks at them and you counted how many seconds he went through with each person up till this point in time. Probably just out of, like, you know rhythm, right? Like you're a musician and it's just sort of, there's this kind of like, you kind of just sort of got the rhythm. It's like papers, work pass, beat, beat, go ahead. Papers, work pass, beat, beat, go ahead. Like that's just the rhythm that this person's been going through and it comes to you and it's papers, work pass, beat, 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 beat. How are you feeling right now? Hmm. She feels much like before performance, just waiting. Mm -hmm. And the seconds linger longer than they should and you start hearing this sort of murmur behind and there's this sort of electric tension in the air and you don't know if he's going to let you through or not or if he's caught you if maybe maybe you've been found out what do you do right now it's one more beat that passes. What do you do? It's quiet. He's looking at your papers. He might be looking at you. He might be seeing through this whole thing right now. He might at any moment call the rest of the gendarmerie and arrest you and put you in some sort of pit. What do you do? She bites her tongue so hard that it probably bleeds a little bit but she doesn't say anything take one mental stress and after what seems like four hours but is probably about 45 seconds he goes go on the bus and then you hear after papers, work pass, beat, beat, go on the bus, papers, work pass, beat, beat, go on the bus. And like that rhythm picks back up again. And you don't know if he, if he saw something or didn't, but he lets you on and he doesn't stop you at all, but it rattles you just a little bit, just a little bit. And you all sit on this bus, and there are probably 50 of you. And the bus, the engine rolls up. And you begin to move outside of the city north, and north the suburbs of Paris, outside of Paris. Here you are in German-occupied France, surrounded with, on this bus, uh, the Paris uh, Parisian-French gendarmerie. And as you move out towards the suburbs, you see them. They are um, 10-story apartment blocks. There are uh, four of them in a horseshoe. And you can see them from quite far away because they're 10-story apartment blocks. And they're modern. Uh, They're the most modern apartment blocks you can see. They're sort of gleaming. And as you sort of get, as the bus gets closer and closer and closer, you start to be able to get more detail. And 
what you notice is that very hastily massive barbed wire has been built barbed wire fences have been built all around these apartment blocks um these four 10-story apartment blocks so the entire thing there was like a it was sort of made in a u-shape so it was a nice courtyard it was meant to be um it was meant to be some sort of clearly modern high-tech uh new sort of apartment blocks although they're actually not new anymore but at one point in time when they were built they were meant to be something sort of special um but they're they're not that now and as you're pulling in towards this uh place that was maybe meant you you you've lived in cities maybe you guess this was meant to house maybe 700 people perhaps maybe a little bit more um the entire as you come up you see not a german in sight all french french police with guns um the Germans are not here, it's all the French. And this place has got in it thousands and thousands of people, all with uh, Jewish stars um, or yellow triangles. And they're crowded into this block. And as your bus is moving, pulling into this place, and people are moved to the side, and you can hear the gendarmerie shouting at people to move. You see uh, people, you see children crying. Um, you see an old man sort of just wandering in shock. Um, you see sort of families huddled, uh, people looking um, like their world has fallen out from underneath them. And there's no room it's cluttered and when you see these apartment blocks the windows are open and you can see multiple people sort of looking out the windows just far too crushed into these apartments on the inside um, you see some buckets uh, of water and that's it um, there's almost uh, i mean it's it's inhumane um, it's crowded and all around you have the gendarmerie um, watching, keeping charge, and you can see there are um, um, uh, watchtowers around these barbed wire fences uh, with gendarmes with it looks like sort of uh, machine gun nests up there, and you're sort of pulled in with just like just families, you know, just people, all sorts of just regular, just people. Like it's not it's it's women, children. Uh, men, grandparents, all ages, from very small to very old, all sort of penned in this courtyard, um, looking afraid and uncertain and, and a little defeated as they're um, kept there. And you can hear the sounds of, of languages. Um, a lot of Eastern European languages are being spoken. and. Um, I need you to make a will roll to sort of deal with this um, this psychological stress. Oh, I actually have that. <laughs> I need a will. Um, two. Um, you know that something, and you you know about the gas. You know about these people who are sitting here, and you think these people. This is a, 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 I think, a good shock. It's a three. Um, and you know, it's not, it's not good for these people. Um, so you have failed by one. What would you like to do about that? Um, That's one I mental mean, stress or pay a fate point? I... And justify it if you give me a an aspect if you have it. No, I mean I think that's shocking. <laughs> yeah. So you're gonna fill in one of your mental stress boxes. Mm -hmm. Do you have any left? I do. Mm, all right. Because you've taken one already, right? This I is have. your second one. Do you have I, three boxes? I do. Good for you. Good for I'm, you. I'm, you're willful. One, one is not <laughs> this. 
chaotic and impulsive without being having okay. a lot of space for, for this is true for mental stress um tell me how you're feeling when you see all of these people and let me tell you if you thought it would be easy to just find dimitri seeing the massiveness that the... i i think the first initial i think the first initial thought was how am i going to find him it's it's a needle in a haystack yeah. is is beyond what i'm seeing here and then and then i think after that it starts to sink in like as she looks and starts to see the actual faces of people mm -hmm. um then it starts to sink in like what she's actually seeing um, mm -hmm. which I think is going to, you know, definitely make things a little different, uh, you know, following all of this. <laughs> and you're all hustled off the bus as you're processing your thoughts. Uh, the gendarmerie sort of take you all, you, you 50 women, and they move you off to some smaller buildings, which are clearly uh, barracks um, for, it seems, uh, people who would be staying on site, like the gendarmerie. Um, they clearly have shifts of people who are here, who are planning to be here, and they're taking you to the, they're, they're not taking you to clean um, where the people are. They're taking you to clean the barracks where the gendarmes are staying. And, uh, they also want you to sort of clean up around the courtyard to make sure that nothing will obscure the view of the machine gun nests on the out outposts. And they sort of bark some orders about, and like they, they make sure there are supplies there for you, but they don't pay that much attention to you, um, generally speaking, because you're not really worth their notice, right? Perfect. <laughs> but I will say this, the people that you're working with also seem to be shaken because you'll have to remember um, they only brought these people in two days ago. So Drancy did not have hardly anyone uh, in it three days earlier. And so this was just all moved in two days ago. So this is, it's a little bit chaotic. And some of the work they want you to do is also setting up things. It's not just cleaning. Sometimes it's moving in bedding, moving out bedding. So there's some, there's some moving of, of supplies they want you to do. Um, things like giving blankets to each of the rooms so like maybe one blanket for 10 people like they're these sort of like some basic supplies they want you to sort of uh give as you're giving out as you're as you're doing your work i'm going to ask muriel um is is this how it's been and then she says They took away 300 people yesterday. Uh, this is insanity. Um, uh, are the matter at hand, are the, is there the people, are they, are they organized? Is there by uh, men, women, um... and and she sort of thinks, oh, um, they've separated the men and the women. Um, the children are with the women. They've put them in different blocks. Um, the men are there, and she sort of kind of gives you an outline, and it seems as if they have separated them by by gender to be appropriate. Um, in oh, this heavens. way, oh heavens, <laughs> yes, they have to be appropriate. And hang on, allow me to clutch my, my necklace. <laughs> <laughs> and and she sort of notes that and she says, but there's not enough space for everyone. I think that seems evident. There seems they're going to keep piling everyone in until they're bursting forth through the windows. 
Um, and then she well, says, I just don't understand what they're saying. What they're saying? I don't speak uh, Russian or, or Polish or whatever it is. Oh. They sometimes ask me questions, but I, I don't know. I don't either. I have to ask you a question as a GM. Do you speak Polish? I I think she, because of her time with Dimitri, she would have learned like little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, f- conversationally holding yeah. like would not necessarily yeah. be a thing. Um, but like perhaps basic, you know, like super basic things, I think could be the idea yeah. could come yeah. across. That makes sense. Um, you know, philosophy literature, no no. <laughs> some basic things, yeah. But just some basic things. Oh, and the... perhaps some really eclectic words too, just yeah. based on the relationship they had. But you might have some philosophy and maybe a little bit of art. It's 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 unclear. Uh, right, right. But just like a word here and there. Yeah. Um but um you know uh, there are a few words I picked up. Uh may I May I try and help? And she says, well, we just can't get in any trouble. Just keep your head down. It's clear that she just kind of wants to get, it's it's like the, the coping process is to just keep your head down and clean and don't see anything. Um, um, well, they're, they're wanting us to hand out these blankets, yes? Mm. Um, how about I do that? Okay, and so she's going to load you up with like scores of blankets. And... Um, Take as many as the arms will hold. As and like maybe our two or three people are going to sort of come with you, but while she's going to go and she's going to start sort of mopping and scrubbing uh, these these barracks for the gendarmerie um, is what she's planning on doing because she clearly doesn't want to go into the building. Um, I am going to start in the mail section. I mean, I'm on a mission here, so and. You walk into this multi-story apartment complex, and when you walk in, it's just a lot of of everyday people. You know, they're wearing uh, suits, uh, work clothes. They are just regular people, and they're all. Uh, sort of looking like like an explosion has happened and they see you walk in and and everybody's like a sort of a different and there's like another one with you who's sort of going off and everyone has like a slightly different reaction to you um but for the most part they're all very very respectful uh they don't crowd you um they don't rush you um they sort of wait politely for you to give them the blanket and then they're going to have to sort of deal with what they're going to do with the blankets themselves um, as how they're going to sort of deal with these blankets. There are far fewer blankets for the men's section than they've given you for the women's section or the children's section. Uh, But with each of these apartments, there's like, you know, 20 people in this apartment and there's no beds, right? There's no chairs. They're just um, stacked in here. And you can hear them talking in, in various, uh, you can hear them talking in Yiddish, Russian, Polish, um, Romanian, Czechoslovakian, Bulgarian. So like lots of different sort of Eastern European language here and there, whispers. Um, what do you do? Um, as I hand the blankets out, I yeah. am going to... She, it would have said on the paper which work camp he came from, and the family told her to. Yes. Um, what was the name of that? Uh, that work camp, it's like a small, it's like a small name out of Poland. They had shipped in back out there, which is never a place you want to go. Um, but he was shipped back. Um, she, as she is handing out the blankets, she is going to ask if anyone knows anyone who has been out there um do you ask in polish or french polish 
or also bits of Yiddish? Because I imagine you might have picked up a little bit of that as well, depending. Um, she is going to kind of assess based on like, you know, listening to what it sounds like people in the room or, you know, or the people coming up to her are kind of talking. <laughs> Um, you get a mix of, uh, there's quite a bit of Yiddish, but you also get a mix, uh, like there's some Polish in there, there's some Russian, like there's a sort of mix, but you also uh, get Yiddish here and there as well. So there's a bit of a mix. Um, yeah, I think she'll mostly try in Polish, I think. Okay. Um, you speak. What do you say in your broken Polish? Um, here's a blanket. Hope you're comfortable as much as can be. Um, uh, have have seen um, uh, men f from camp in Poland here. Do you give the name? Pardon? Do you give the name? Yes. And you say that you speak to them in Polish. And the whole tone changes a little bit. People look at you, these men, and in their faces is that sense of relief, of hope, and of recognition as if someone is speaking the language that they speak. And what might that mean? Confusion? Possibility? Like, the minute you speak, it's like someone, right, possibility is there at this moment. And people, a, a, a young man, he must be like 15 comes up to you and he sort of tugs on your shoulder and and then some and he starts to say something in polish and then someone else starts to say something in polish and you're hearing more and more people murmuring to you and you're not getting all all of the things they're saying but you're getting little snippets like can you can you tell my family outside can you give a message people want you to give messages to people that they know outside to Tell them I'm safe. Um, here's my here's an address, and so you're hearing these addresses and names and messages and and people's names of loved ones who are outside. Um, tell them I'm safe, and people are are are, are looking uh, for pieces of paper, and they're also looking to make sure the gendarmerie is not is not here at this moment. And it's at this moment there there are numerous people coming and and you can hear maybe somebody rush off to go deeper into the complex uh, and you hear them sort of you hear you don't know like are they going to ask to get more people or are they asking for dimitri and maybe they're asking to see if the person you're looking for is there but you are surrounded by people who need you to get words out to their loved ones I'm going to look around this as I look around this area does it does it look like there's anyone like an older like of of the people who are being held there an older person or somebody who looks like he would be the in charge guy of the group mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I need from you uh, uh, this seems to me like it would be awareness Oh, it probably would. You are absolutely correct. And yet that makes me so sad. Because I feel like it wouldn't be investigation, but I think it would be awareness. It doesn't matter. I don't have investigation either. It's... That's not your forte. Oh, no. Well, I 
you know, just do not know. Um, you could succeed at a major cost. Could I? You could. You know, I, I'm... But it would be a major cost. You know what? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I'm going to pick out somebody who's just close. You don't want the major cost? I don't want that. No, nope. oh, right. it's not for me. Um, fine. Someone who's nearby who's just being a nearby guy. You reach out um, to, uh, you know, a man who seems to be, I would say, early 20s. Um, spectacles. One of the lenses is, is cracked. He looks uh, like a, a, he's clean cut. Um, he's, he looks like a college student. Okay. And actually, as I say that, I'm going to reach out to him and pull in a few other people while they're here. We're going to, we're going to spread this around. You know what? We're, we're not looking for the head of the pack anyway. We're, this is a group effort. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, going to say to these people quietly, um, under the guise as I'm straightening these blankets out. I'm, I'm looking for uh, Dimitri Bergson. Also, tell everyone um, as quickly as you can, if you have anything on a small paper, write it down and get it to me as fast as you can. I think that would be a rapport. Three. Mm -hmm. It is not hard to convince them. They are very, <laughs> they, like, they, you know, they are, they are, um, they are not hard to convince. Uh, they don't have a lot to lose. But what you want them is to do this subtly but quickly. Yes. And so they, piece by piece, sort of go off in little pieces. And, and tell them also to spread that around. And one of them, it's a very old man, he looks like he could be a, a great grandfather, just walks up to you and grabs your hands and he kisses your hands. And he's got tears in his eyes. And he says, uh, in French, which is not very good, he says, thank you. And he just sort of wanders off a little bit. Wait, before he goes, um, I'll, I'll kind of squeeze his hands back. I'll say, um, uh, Grandpa, is there anyone you want me to say anything to? He says, I have a beautiful granddaughter. She's married to a Frenchman. Uh, Ruth is her name. Uh, Wachowski. And that was her name. She's married now to a Frenchman. Uh, Gavreau, uh, they live, they live in uh, Montparnasse. Um, oh, it's uh, Nathaniel, uh, Gavreau, and uh, Ruth. Tell them they should leave the city. She's a French citizen now, but They'll come for them, too. And tell her I'll be okay. I will. And he just pats your shoulder. He says, you're a very good young lady. And then he just says, they took all of my furniture as he sort of walks away. So she's going to, uh, I guess, move to the next area with blankets and kind of, I get just repeat repeating uh, the same thing 
in every cell. We're going to do a contest. Okay. Who gets to three first is the uh, question. I'm going to need from you deceive mm -hmm. not to deceive the people you're talking to sure but, but to deceive the gendarmerie to make it look like you're not doing anything suspicious i'm so innocent looking <laughs> uh -huh. because people are wanting to give you messages and they're wanting to give you notes and they're wanting to talk to you and i'm wanting to take them and you're wanting to take them natural and organic sort of way mm -hmm. so it's going to have to be a little bit of you versus them okay. and we're going to have this to see who gets to three first cool mm -hmm. i need you to do your deception and i will do their investigation or really awareness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that is not a success for you no it's not uh, that is a success for them. So you are uh, moving again. You need to get a two, by the way. You're moving through uh, sending out messages. And you can see it. Now, uh, Krellen, by the way, thinks you should reroll that. I think I should reroll that too. That's pretty much the worst that I could possibly get. I'm going to mm -hmm. go ahead and reroll it. What's, your, what's the justification? Um, I've just started participating in this behavior. Mm -hmm. It, it's not that seedy yet. <laughs> uh, what's your aspect? Um, I am... Either yours or the uh, resistance members. I am rolling with being always prepared. Tell me how. I'm going <laughs> to tell you right now, a, a gendarme sort of starts walking by right as somebody is wanting to sort of give you some kind of message. And you've got your blankets and, uh, and this uh, gendarme sort of just sort of moves right by you. I'll start, whoa, t dropping the blankets and be like, oh, get, well, and I won't say anything, mm. but I'll just like start dropping them like and, kind of all over the place. And the, and the, the people in the, the people in this camp start helping you pick it up. Uh, Reroll. Ooh. <laughs> that was meant to be. It was meant to be. And the gendarme sort of looks at you and doesn't say anything, but notes what's going on and sort of continues walking but is now looking at you you're moving on to the next section i need another mm -hmm. deceive roll oh and did you pay that fate point for it oh mm -hmm. goodbye fate point i loved you so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. go ahead and here we go. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you a question. <laughs> they also oh. make a success. They're at two. If you spend a fate point, that'll bump you to a four, and you'll succeed with style, which means you'll get two successes, and you'll be tied with them. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That sounds like something I totally want to do. As opposed to just one success. Um, that, that doesn't even take any question. And I will base this on my, mm -hmm. uh, aspect that I'm a performer, a good performer, a damn good yes. performer. Yes. Yes. Um, so in this moment you're coming through and as you're sort of moving to the next section and people are coming in to get blankets and they're whispering hushed things to you and you're sort of whispering hushed things back and people are moving out. Another set of the gendarme stops by and sort of looks to see what you're doing just just observing this this process and we don't know if they like what they see but they don't say anything just what do you what do you do i based on what happened in the last room um have also started spreading word that um because i noticed that these supposed keepers of the peace um were coming around and, and giving me the the duck eye um so 
I, in preparation for just such a thing, decided to rely, in, instead of my my clumsy act, I decided mm. to rely on a new act that I thought they might prefer. Mm. And this act is called Yelling at the Prisoners. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What do you do? So they start walking by. Yeah. And I take a blanket and I throw it on the floor. Mm. And then I, then um, in a rough accented voice, I tell them to pick it up meanly. Mm. And this. And I tell them to look woe, like I told them before to look very woe struck. Yeah. And this is Jean who was questioning you for a moment, just gives this smirk. And as you yell at this guy, who's looking a bit woeful, just turns his back as if to let this happen and moves forward. Also, I, um, while he's down there, uh, I'm going to have him slip a note into my sock. Hmm. And he does. He slips this little note into your sock. Perfect. Last roll, you're both tied. Oh, I don't like being tied. Mm-hmm. That is a success for you. I I'm, like that. I'm going to roll mine. So. I could weep. <laughs> you're moving into this deeper, deeper. And it's this sort of strange thing where word moves before it gets to you, right? Before you move into the place people have already heard. And you notice that people are guiding you a little bit. It seems like, at first it seems like you're walking through the building, but then it's very subtle. It's very subtle. Just people standing in, in, in one way, blocking one side of a hallway, and so you then walk towards another side of the hallway. And then you walk up a flight of stairs and it's, and then like somebody's blocking one of the exits. So you don't go, you don't leave that floor. You go up to another floor. It's just this very subtle thing they're doing to give you a path um, so that you don't go through the entire building with all the gendarmerie, but more directed. And you get to the fifth floor and you're moving slowly, slowly through people just sort of like these men sort of touching you. It's not, it's not, it's not in any way sexual. Mm -hmm. um, it's just like to give you a, a word or a message. And you're brought to the end of this hallway and this door, uh, the doors have all been removed. And there's a room and the room is full of people. And as you peer into this room, the people yet sort of part. And at the back of this room, you see, huddled in the corner, with a thin, clearly not eaten well in some time, uh, with uh, a nose that has clearly been broken and healed not the best way. Um, a black eye, it's a little swollen, um, not currently bleeding, but uh, a sense of uh, that this person's gone through quite a bit. And uh, if I remember, he was a painter, was he not? Yes. Left or right-handed? Left-handed. His left hand is crushed. It looks like somebody stepped on his hand. And his fingers are broken, but not bandaged. And there in the corner is Dimitri. And I need a will roll for mental trauma. I, well, I was about to say, I can tell you what I immediately what I think would happen. Tell me. <clears throat> oh, I think she would drop the blankets on the floor and I think she would say she would call out and like go to him immediately. Roll your will roll. 
<laughs> That's a one. Uh, you, one. You miss it by two. What would you like to do about that? Um, I mean, I... So what happens after the three? Um, well, you if you get more mental stress, you'll have to take a consequence. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think she can not take that. All right. Now I'll have to work really hard not to take more, but... Mm -hmm. You, or you could alternately just take a consequence rather than uh, take the stress. Um, I'm listening. I could the, take a consequence, you say. Because here's the thing, your stress box is worth three, but that lowest consequence is worth two, and you have to soak two. So either you fill in the stress box, which heals much faster, um, or you take a consequence, but, that, but it, it's a, it depends on what, you know, if, if you're worried about things. Mm, we'll take the stress for now. Okay. We'll, we'll roll with this. Okay. Um, and he looks up to you and tears she's stream on his face. Just, you know, and I, I imagine, you know, she'll I, I, what? Maybe she set them down. Maybe I, I don't know. She she doesn't know. Um, call Dimitri. Goes over and just like rushes right over and just like kneels down right by him, and is just like pawing at him. And he's clearly been injured. Um, in a way. That oh no my god! Your what happened to you? Oh my god! Your hand. You what? What happened? You're. Oh, you're all skin and bones. What are you? Are you okay? How are you feeling? She's just like she has his face in her hands. And that's what? where we go to break. That's where we go to break. Mm. It is. It is break time, everyone. I think it's time to give Fox a little thought to what she's going to do now. She's found him. What's going to happen? But what is she going to do now? Um, yes. So, my friends, this is our this is our uh, break. <laughs> Sam! <laughs> um, yes. I. What do we have? We have. I want to thank uh, thanks uh, thanks to Rissa for those bits. Uh, I want to thank Volpes for the resub who says, "If I do this now, there is no song. We'll get you a song on on Thursday." Um, it is break cliffhanger. We have. Sylvie has been able to find Dimitri before the gendarmerie has been alerted to her shenanigans. Shenanigans. But now she's with this man who is not in good shape. She herself is at the complete edge of her stress, her psychological stress at this moment. And she has in her possession scraps of messages and papers, so many of them, and whispered words, and she's in the middle of this uh, housing block. And she has to think what she's going to do now, and that she will do during break. And I would like everyone to go and take a, a hydrate, stretch your legs, get some water, um, and I will say this, just in case you all want to know, uh, she has no personal fate points left, but she has the four left that you all have gifted her. And so, if she makes it out here, this will be to your thanks. We'll see you in about ten minutes, everybody. Enjoy some period radio. We'll be right back. Dragon's Journal, featuring Walter Insel, America's one-man newspaper. His famous column appears in the New York Daily Mirror and over 725 other newspapers, from New York to Shanghai, China. He's here with flash news, odd news, exclusive news. Walter Insel is brought to you by Jergens Lotion, the lotion for soft, smooth, romantic hands. As one gardener to another, Mrs. Beatrice Clark of Seattle writes, You don't have to try to hide your hands at the bridge table during gardening season. I used to. 
But now I use Jergens lotion regularly, and my hands are beautifully smooth. Mrs. Clark says other lotions fail to help her, but Jergens lotion does the trick. You see, when you're working outdoors with your hands often wet, your hand skin begins to lose its natural lubricating moisture and looks coarse and crackly and feels rough. But when you apply Jergens lotion, you furnish your unhappy skin with new, refreshing, softening moisture. Jergens lotion smooths on quickly, never feels sticky. Many clever women keep a second bottle of Jergens in the kitchen, handy to use after every use of water. Try this yourself if you want to be proud of your charming feminine hands. But be sure and use our favorite Jergens lotion. And now to the editorial room of the Jergens Journal and Walter Winchell. Good evening, Mr. Mr. North and South America and all the ships and clippers at sea. Let's go to France, France, London. The terms of surrender for the Italian army in Ethiopia have just been handed to Mussolini's representatives. This will give England about 38,000 prisoners, bringing the number of Italians captured in Ethiopia to 200,000. London. Reports persisted in England today that the wife of Rudolf Hess has been arrested by the Nazi police. Akron, Ohio. A big strike in the Goodrich rubber plant here was called off today when CIO workers agreed on a six-cent raise in pay per hour. The government today is trying to settle 18 defense strikes. Boston, Massachusetts. The condition of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, here, who was hurt today in a motor car crash near Walpole, Massachusetts, is not serious. The president's boy, an ensign in the Naval Reserve, Turned over when a tire blew out. Philadelphia. The G-men are investigating the $1 million shipyard fire today, which caused the death of Michael Regan, the watchman. Regan was found on the piles of wreckage at the yard, which deals mainly in defense work. Police believe Regan was murdered by saboteurs. New York. It's a baby boy for the fortune Peter Ryans at the doctor's hospital, New York City. She is the former Anne Royal of New York and Mount Kisco and the New York Social Register. It is also a baby girl for the George Henrys at the same hospital, the doctors. Washington. The federal agents and the police arrested aliens all over the nation during the weekend. The coast-to-coast -coast total was 169 arrests. 92 of the aliens were arrested in New York City, 28 in Florida, and 15 in San Francisco. New York. The most thrilling spectacle in the history of New York was Mayor LaGuardia's I Am an American Day rally in Central Park today. The mayor said it was the biggest crowd in the history of the nation to attend a patriotic rally. Over 675,000 people. In Chicago, William Newton spoke before 125,000 Americans. France, Little River, South Carolina. An excursion boat by name the Nightingale. The Nightingale, an excursion boat, reported carrying employees of the Rocky Mount plant of the Orange Crush Bottling Company exploded in the Atlantic Ocean. It happened seven miles offshore. Seven persons are reported killed, and several others may have drowned. Coast Guard boats are on the scene. The name of the boat, an excursion boat, is the Nightingale. The passengers, employees, of the Rocky Mount plant of the Orange Crush Bottling Company. It happened in the Atlantic Ocean. Behind the international scene, Washington. These are believed to be the Nazi battle plans for the Near East and Africa. Syria is the base for three pincer movements. To the north against Turkey, to the southeast against Iraq, and to the south against Palestine and Suez. The first drive will be southeast on Iraq, where the heavily outnumbered British face precisely the same situation as Greece and Dunkirk. Except that the British Navy faces a trip around Arabia 2,500 miles. Russia is expected to push south from the Caspian area to the Persian Gulf at the very same time. From the left flank will come heavy reinforcements of Nazis through French North Africa for the drive on Egypt. With Suez mopped up, all Nazi forces will unite and the drive west on the Atlantic will start against Gibraltar and Dakar, only 1,600 miles from South America. London. For practical purposes, the Hess flight is of no importance. Its cause is his aversion to Russia. Hess is said to have made this comment. Comrade in Russian means kamerad, which is surrender, in German. Lisbon. Turkey is lost to England as an ally. Eden's belief that Turkey will resist is discounted in most diplomatic circles, and that Turkey's resistance would be futile 
is accepted by all the experts. BC. United Press yesterday revealed this attitude by the BC government. It was explained that France was grateful for American food, but that this American aid, said France, was very little and unimportant. In fact, the word used was infinitesimal. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the absolute lowdown. How only a few shiploads of food to France helped the war effort of the Germans. Ten shiploads a week, amounting to 50,000 tons sent to France, would replace in calorie values 187,500 tons of potatoes, from which could be extracted 16,875 tons of alcohol, which would free 11,000 tons of gasoline, and that would enable 250 bombs and 250 Nazi fighting planes to raid London every night for two months. Attention, Mr. and Mrs. United States. At any given time, there can be only one President of the United States. Constitutionally, he is charged with the responsibility of our foreign affairs, which means that morally, his policies are entitled to your support. Last fall, the American people knew that democratic institutions were under worldwide attack, and the captain they picked for our ship of state was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The dictators were fools. They had predicted disaster. But the American way was strong enough to hold an election in the middle of a crisis. The dictator seeks to prolong that crisis to divide us. To the intense disappointment of Joe Goebbels of Berlin, Wendell Wilkie stands by the American way. The candidate to Wilkie opposed as Franklin D. Roosevelt, he loyally supports as President of the United States. At the election, Wendell Wilkie had won the votes of many. Since the election, he has won the respect of all Americans by forfeiting a Nazi medal forever. Mr. Wilkie set an example of working democracy. He has shown the dictators that the leader of a large minority will wholeheartedly support a leader elected by a small majority. But more important, Wendell Wilkie has shown the principal resource of democracy. In the showdown, ladies and gentlemen, Roosevelt can depend upon a Wilkie while Hitler has only a head. The Walter Winchell Warmonger Department, for the edification of Mr. and Mrs. Rip Van Winkle, from border to border and coast to coast. Los Angeles. Attention Toledo, Ohio. A few weeks ago, I reported that one Kenneth Eggert of Toledo was allegedly one of the agitators of a strike against the defense plants on the West Coast. And that this very same Eggert was a communist troublemaker. Eggert demanded a copy of Winchell's remarks and threatened to sue me for my called malicious lie about him, etc., etc. The Dyes Congressional Committee sends me the following information. That Kenneth Eggert, alias Eggert, or Eckert, was issued a passport to go to Russia on November the 3rd, 1932, and that the files of the State Department also reveal that the passage to Russia of this communist-inspired strike agitator was paid for by the Communist Party. Washington, D.C. On Wednesday next week...
and we are back for the second half of City of Light and Shadow, a solo episode with Sylvie Eugenie Moreau. It's me! So, um, how's everyone doing over there, chat? I hope you're doing well. You know, I like to do a thing. Um, when I am, uh, as, as a GM, it's a thing I like to do. I like to ask the players a question so we can get to know their character better. And I like to do that every episode. Sometimes I do it this, at the top. Sometimes I do it not at all. Sometimes I do it in the middle. And I'm going to do it right now. There's only one player, so only one player gets to answer this question. I'm only a little scared. <laughs> oh, no. That's, that makes it worse. <laughs> Um, why don't you tell me, oh, side note, by the way, Chad, in case you don't know, I just want to share with you, we do use safety mechanisms here. We actually use three different safety, safety mechanisms. We have lines and veils, which we all did um, at our session zero, but we also have lines and veils up as a Google Doc, so people can always add to that mm -hmm. lines and veils at any time. We also have uh, the uh, red and yellow card, which are uh, available at all times. So for example, uh, here we could just, uh, you can just throw in a red card. If it's, if you're feeling like this is no, or- I was nodding too vigorously, I apologize. <laughs> so it is fine. Or a, oops, here we go. Or a yellow card. Um, if, if you're feeling like let's not escalate. So we have both red and yellow cards mm -hmm. available for, uh, any player or the gym if they want to to sort of do that and we also have available to us uh, okay check-in which we tend to do in uh, zoom chat so at any time I can just do a little circle check-in to make sure or I can do a gesture make sure everybody's okay and people can come back with a thumbs up or like a, mm, I don't know so I just want you to know that we are using safety tools because they are useful and they allow us to make sure that we have a good and um, a good and safe game yeah, and I think just on the back of that, since we've actually done panels on things like this before, I think that's uh, very important for any role-playing situation. Um, you know, even one that isn't necessarily dealing with heavy topics, because you never know. You never know. And it's it's what allows us to like because this is a kind of a heavy game and this is a pretty heavy session and it's what allows us to it allows me to make sure that I can feel comfortable and knowing that my players are comfortable. So. Um, consent all around and i just want to let you know that we're doing it and if uh and if you have never used safety tools i recommend them they're pretty awesome they're they're really great um and they're also really good um especially if you're doing horror but even if you're not like i i recommend them so let me ask you your question <laughs> um and i ask you because i love you oh no could you tell me your happiest memory with Dimitri? Um, I could. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, it would be probably, there are a few I think that would come to mind. Um, but one of the ones that I think would be, um, and for Sylvie, it's, it might seem kind of interesting because it's may seem a little out of character. Uh, it's, you know, not a, a big party kind mm -hmm. of situation or, or wild and crazy or anything like that. Um, but it is one time when they had rented a little, just like a little art cottage and cottage is a generous word for the, the locale that they stayed. Um, you know, more like a little shanty hostel that some friends that they know that live in the countryside happen to have. Mm. Shack, shed, and you know, one of these things. But the inside had some drapes, so mm -hmm. that was nice. Um, you know, but they, um, they ended up staying out over there. And then um, Sylvie, not necessarily, as we all know, being the morning person that she is, she actually remembers she had woken up right as the um, sun came up over this little pond that they had. And I and imagine like, roosters were were cocking in the background, right? Because you're in the countryside. 
they, they were, but it was just, it didn't, it wasn't enough to be intrusive. Um, well, like he comes, it, the sun comes up and like is coming through like the kind of gauzy drapes and, you know, at the entrance to this thing and comes over and like just kind of lit this area that they were like sleeping in. She woke up and he was still asleep, you know, but it was just this really nice, serene kind of early morning thing. And she was actually, and she was actually feeling quite awake at that point in time, but just this really nice, peaceful morning. Um, it's a nice, quiet. Uh, this shack, uh, did he have an easel set up? He did kind of down by the, uh, the pond. He was trying to get water, right? <laughs> uh, that's hard. Uh, so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows if that'll happen, but... <laughs> Who knows if that will happen. And so, let me see, you had some uh, painting that time. How long were you there for? Um, they were actually there for, like, a week and a half. Oh, and Char was... Charlie has watched over the bar, maybe. A... She she would more appropriately be a bricktop manager than Tango, despite the fact that he has taken on the title. <laughs> Well, he says a lot of things. Tango says he a says lot of a things. He says a lot of things to a lot of people. <laughs> um, and I imagine the food was great um, out there in the countryside. And yeah. Painting and uh, fresh bread, sort of freshly baked. Um, and what did you do in that week and a half? Um, you know, I kind of just took it easy. Hmm. You know, like hung out um, just outside painting reading poetry um and just spending time together you know and that's and that's i think why it seems so perhaps out of character um because it was just a very like rustic low energy level and quiet time yeah. um but she but she remembers that very fondly may i ask you one more question uh yes <laughs> uh did you have nicknames for each other yeah. Would you care to share them? Well, she, so D Dimitri tended to call Sylvie the she-devil. <laughs> um, there's no reason behind that. No, I'm sure. <laughs> um, and uh, Sylvie actually called Dimitri her little peanut. <laughs> so. Okay. And so we bring the lights back up on our scene. And we're in this uh, apartment that has, has no amenities in it whatsoever. Um, and the water isn't even running. And in the corner is this man that you once knew, that you spent um, a week and a half in the countryside with. Uh, an artist of some skill, and he's uh, broken. His mind is not broken. His mind is there. You can tell by the look in his eyes. But his body, um, his body has taken a lot of damage. And he looks up at you as if he cannot believe his eyes. And he reaches out, he goes to reach out with his left hand, but he retracts it as he tries to sort of extend his fingers. And then he just reaches out with his right hand. And he goes, She takes it. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? What are you doing here? What, what is this? What's happened? I don't know why they brought me here, but... Ah, oh, she devil, you should not be here. Also, what is this look? Uh, I'm, I'm a cleaner today. Uh, you, you shouldn't be here. I shouldn't do a lot of things. Well, that's true. <laughs> and she is like trying to clean off like some of the yuck on him. Do you have first aid? No. All right. <laughs> Not even a little bit, but she has some empathy. 
which is like first aid for the heart. That is true. Why don't you roll it for me? I will. Mm -hmm. I will. It may not do much for a person who's super damaged. Oh. Ooh. Maybe his spirits are raised a little. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, you will you will be able to get him into a little bit of recovery uh, psychologically, which will keep him better for a while. Um, he says, oh, my, my little peanut, they've cracked you. No. What? Your no. hand, your, this is your painting hand. It, uh, you know, I will get better. I just need a little bit of time to heal. Uh, how, how, <laughs> no, what is this face? What is with I... your eyebrows? And you sort of smooth your eyebrows. Come now. Uh, how's how's first... Charlie? Uh, she's she's good. She's good. She she's been watching the bar. Uh, how is the club? It's it's good. It's it's been we've been hanging in there, you know. Uh, are you tell me tell me about everything tell me about what you're singing tell me tell me that you're happy it's it's hard to be happy in with times like as they are you know <laughs> yes i i sent a family to you did you did they make it to you to make sure you got them out <laughs> I knew, I knew you would always do the right thing. We, uh, we... She leans way in. I mean, hmm. everyone there is, you know, but... And you notice, you notice when you look to them, because you've, you now, you sort of looked, uh, they're all turning their backs to give you privacy. They've all just like turned their backs Petri, we we run the resistance i don't is this i don't want anything bad to happen to you we can, you know we always talked about we can't do nothing and in, mm. in these times that's even more important no, it's true. it's true. I so cold. Oh, uh, uh, she, she looks for something. <laughs> and you've given away all of your blankets by this time. Dimitri, I, I don't have any more blankets. It's okay. Um, Dimitri, I. I came to find you. That's because you're stupid. <laughs> Impulsive. You're... Rash. You're so always leading with your heart. Always. That's... Why I love you. <laughs> Dimitri, I... Dimitri, I don't know how to get you out. Uh, I wish I still had... Uh, my dancing legs, then we could dance out of here. <laughs> but I think my ankle's broken. Oh! Um, she is gonna actually just, like, tear off a part of her shirt and start, like, trying to wrap it around there. Give me a first aid. Would that be a four roll? 4DF. Oh. Because you do not have first aid, I don't think. Oh, no, I may have made it worse. Um, you try, right? You rip off some of your shirt and you try, but you don't know first aid. Like, no. what you're, you're like, I suppose I wrap it, and you wrap it. Wrapping seems right. And he just sort of, you can tell he's tired, right? Like, he's got this energy seeing you. That, that lights him up, but you can tell he's tired. He's, um, he has a little bit of a hard time breathing. He might have some broken ribs. Um, 
and he clearly hasn't eaten in a while. And he's also clearly trying to make you feel better. Mm. And he says, oh, don't worry. If I had, if I had my dancing legs, we'd dance out of here. You were always the best at tango. I, there's no time to be talking about dancing. <laughs> we both know that this is, this isn't good. No. When this I- This isn't good, this is getting, this is getting worse. They've, to make sure they've been taking, they've been taking people. It's getting worse. I know. Listen, uh, some people in here, they've talked. They said there's a, a man in the resistance that can help get people out. His name is the Hawk. I don't know where he is, but he's somewhere in the city. And if you need to get out, you could, you could find this man and he can get you out of here. You shouldn't stay. They... I've heard some things about him. Not good. Oh. But we... I'm a... Dimitri, I'm a part of the resistance, and we... We can get people out, too. I... You know, I... <laughs> oh, sorry. I, laughing is bad. I should not be laughing now. Uh, I... I... I'm not surprised you're a member of the resistance. That's, uh... I think of you now, I have to think of you as my, my spy, my she-devil spy, who just, uh, I don't know, maybe you, do you, I, maybe you're on a bridge at night and the moon is glinting off you, your hair, and I don't know, maybe you blow up a bridge or something. I have worn a trench coat. <laughs> oh, no, don't. <laughs> Sorry, don't make me laugh. That's, <laughs> that's bad. It's. Uh, it is the best medicine, they say. Apparently my my rapping is not, so. You should not be here. This is bad. They're going to bring more people. I, maybe I can, maybe I can distract people. Let help people get out and he tries to stand and you can tell that no, it's no 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 you you don't you you shouldn't move there's so I, many people i have i have notes i have messages oh you should you should get them out but dimitri i want i want to get you out If we got caught, it would be so bad for you. I know. I, I don't want anything bad to happen to you. Listen to me. You know, I've always had a thing for older women. And he, he smiles at you. It is a good thing your hand is broken or else <laughs> I would break it right now. Uh, you can't. Oh, don't cry. You're not supposed to cry, only sing the blues. Do you, can you sing, could you sing for me? What, of course, what, anything. Sing me, oh, something, something sad. Um. Oh, something sad. Um. And he just leans his head on your shoulder. I hate to see the evening sun go down. 
hate to see the evening sun go down because my baby he's gone and left this town feeling tomorrow like I feel today if I'm feeling tomorrow like I feel today I'll pack my truck and make my getaway Sailor we woman with her diamond ring pulls that man around by her apron string. If it weren't for her and her man I love wouldn't have gone nowhere no she pets his head I I can't run I know I can I can't run. She turns and kisses him on the forehead. You were always a terrible runner anyway. I wasn't that bad. I mean, you always beat me, but I was okay. Anyway, I'm an artist. I don't have to run. <laughs> you are an artist. You're an amazing artist. I have something. I have something small. Would you like it? What? What is? All of these, these, what, what do you call them? Uh, in English, how do you say it? These, um, Jokers, you say in English. <laughs> um, they're giving you notes. I, I have something. And he reaches down into a sock. And he pulls out just like a little, like it's like a note like all the rest of them. And he hands it to you uh, with his right hand. What is this? And you is open that... it up. And it's a little sketch of you. Done... Uh, Probably, if you think about it, it looks like it's done perhaps in uh, ash or oil, like the kinds of things you might find right in a, in a camp. Probably done with maybe a stick or parts of his fingers. And it's this small little miniature of your face. And he says, I, I made that uh, before. And I just kept it with me to inspire me, but I thought maybe you'd like it. Oh, Dimitri, it's, it's beautiful. Well, you should, you should listen. I, uh... I don't know if I should say this. It feels strange. But I let you go. I mean, you're always in my heart, but you should live. You should, I don't know, you should sing and have a beautiful life and get out of Paris.
I love you more than anything. I always will. I think I can handle anything now that I've seen your face one last time and I know you're safe and that you are my hero. You've come to rescue your prince in a tower. <laughs> and he looks around and he's like, ah, and it is a tower. It is. And it's surrounded by dragons too. Yeah. He just reaches out and he strokes your cheek. You shouldn't stay much longer. How much longer can you stay here? He kind of looks out to assess like how much time's been going by. I'm not rolling particularly well for the guards. You seem to have more time. They've not come around just yet. But probably is getting to be. Wait, I I have information for you. I'm supposed to be moved to a prison. I was supposed to be moved yesterday um, to be interrogated by a man named Falke. He was supposed to take me, and I was told that he would be interviewing me. They haven't taken me yet. <laughs> she leans in. We killed him. <laughs> oh, no, don't make me laugh. Come on, why do you do this to me? You're amazing. <gasps> One dragon down, my prince. <laughs> so, when I get better, I'll come out. I'll, I'll escape. But I think, I think you have to go without me. I think so. I'm offering you a fate point for that one, my friend. With your cell's trouble, passionate for the cause. There are... There's the personal... And then there is the larger. And you have a trouble aspect. Your cell do. does. And it's passionate for the cause, and it's for the greater cause. What are you offering me the point to do? What would you like? To leave him here. And instead, take out the letters. Take out the what? The letters, the notes. Yeah. Take yeah. that. That is worth a fate point. And he smiles at you. And he says, I, you shouldn't be here too long. I know. Oh, listen. Maybe all those notes, they might search you. Maybe put them under your bandana kerchief. Maybe there, hide them there. Yes, yes. No, that's good. Listen, I, I want you to know I'm going to escape. You don't have to do it for me. I can do it. Hmm. You've never been someone who breaks your promises. Oh, I will try to escape. I just need, I need a little bit more food and a little bit more time. That's all. And maybe when this falc, oh, he's dead. <laughs> uh, well, maybe they'll forget about me. Maybe they will. I... Don't stay. Don't stay here. This place is... This place is ugly. And there should be no beauty like you in a place like this. This... 
is there any, is there anything I can do? Take outside, tell anyone. You brought me the most I could ever hope for. To see your face again. Just live and be happy and sing and know that I will make it out of here or I won't, but no matter what, you have to live. Please. Of course. And there's a... <clears throat> and one of uh, the prisoners is standing there. It's the young college student. You remember him with the broken uh, yes. lens. And he's got the blanket that you gave him. And he hands it to you. And he just sort of gives it a little bit of a nod. And he steps out. Ugh. Thank you, um, Dimitri, this blanket. And she, she kind of covers him. And then she gives him a kiss on the mouth. And he kisses you back, and you can tell from the kiss that it is um, full of love, but also sorrow. It... Um, is not a kiss of bravado or um, confidence. It's a kiss of goodbye. She knows. And she's going to kiss him on the forehead too. And kind of like stroke his hair back. And some of it is falling out a little bit. Just a little. And he says, um, uh, if it weren't for diamonds and the something hair, your St. Louis man wouldn't go nowhere. Nowhere. <laughs> Get some rest. I'll see you on the other side. Okay. I promise I will do my best. Always. And it's okay. It's okay. She'll get up and... And he just, like, takes your hand with his one good hand and he just squeezes it one last time and he just looks at you and you can tell because you've seen him do this when he paints. He's trying to memorize every single detail about the way you look at this moment before you leave. She like squeezes his hand. And it's it's one of those things like staying there like kind of gonna leave, but kind of like that, you know, can't really let go. I'm all right, I'm kind of leaving, but I'm also kind of not letting go kind of thing. And then like the, the, yeah. Yeah. And then finally kind of, and then take a step back and back and then slowly kind of turning around and then very slowly, each step having to be very deliberate. And just out of the corner of your eye, just out of the corner of your eye, as you turn, you see a look of determination in his face. A look that says he will not die today. You can, you know, he kind of sets, he sets his his mind to it, right? That he he will survive. At least that is what he's telling himself at this moment. That'll work for now. And you are sort of ushered out of this building, past people who. And there are too many notes. There are so many of them. 
Um, she will stuff them in every secretive place she can think of. Socks and bandana and everywhere. Yeah, even even just horrible places. <laughs> Bras, like everywhere. Yep, yep, just all over the place. <laughs> and as you are walking out, there's a, a another sort of a not that young of a young man, but he's got fiery eyes and sort of wild hair. Um, he's uh, he's clearly some kind of worker of some sort, you know, like a dock worker, or a factory worker. And he stops you. And he says, Vive le, 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 vive le resistance. Vive le resistance. And he just steps by to let you pass. But he doesn't stay too far from you as you're walking through this place, as sort of as if he's your guard, perhaps, um, as far as he can. And um, you see that he is a Jew, but he's also a communist. You can tell by the iconography um, on the on the, the markings on his clothing. And he just follows you just respectful distance, but enough so that nobody messes with you and that nobody does anything. But of course, nobody in this building does. They see you as their messenger. And they walk you out. And as you're sort of making your way out, you come upon the courtyard. And you have on your person all of these messages, hopes, dreams, poetry, declarations of love, condolences, things to make people feel better. You have um, people's names, where they were from, where they're going, um, just a record of who they were so they wouldn't be forgotten. And you have all of these things on your person. And you can see the women sort of cleaning, some giving out blankets in here. And then you see it. You see one of the gendarmerie hit a young boy who was asking for something with the butt of his rifle and calls him some filthy name and doesn't want to be touched by him. Sylvie, your trouble aspect, your personal trouble aspect, is that you have a very hard time keeping your mouth shut when things like this happen. I will offer you a fate point to say something and get yourself in trouble right about now. I would like to counter offer. Please do. <laughs> I would like to counter offer mm -hmm. that I would like to use my uh, Jeanne boost right about now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yes, you reject this with your gendarme boost. I would like to approach mm -hmm. said individual. <clears throat> For those who don't remember, last session, Sylvie went on a mission to go and talk to the French police. She has a contact in the French police. Uh, and she was very, very convincing, very charming, got a good lay of the land of how the, the police are doing at this moment. And that has given her a one-time boost uh, when dealing with uh, the French police. And so go on. I would like to... I imagine she's probably carrying something out to the bus, yeah. you know, like supplies or something like that. I would like to say that as she's walking out and sees this, she's in an unusually somber mood. Mm -hmm. um, but she still has her irritation about her. So she'll walk by and she'll just stop nearby the activities she's mm -hmm. witnessing. And she'll kind of say to this 
officer. You know, it would be a shame if the higher ups knew that you were behaving in this fashion. And this French officer looks at you and he says, they don't care. <laughs> and he doesn't hit this kid again, but he turns and he spits on the ground and he walks away and he just says, one day France will be free of all of you foreigners. As he leaves you, Whatever, got him away from the kid. <laughs> and the kid... That is That guy is not my problem anymore. <laughs> not your problem. And the kid looks up at you and he just mouths merci. She's going to say, are you okay? And he goes, yeah. And you can tell that he's he's mad and he's determined. And you see, as you're leaving... Oh, hang on. She's going to yeah. tell him. Yeah. Stay strong. The time will come. And this is the thing that you notice. Now we can leave. That you, like, you're on your way out, right? And there's mm -hmm. this kid. This kid has got this look of determination in his eyes. And you are looking at these people as all of you cleaning folks. Uh, and they, they have you clean, you know, are being shuffled out. And you notice a little change in the tone of Drancy. It's not obvious, but it's a change in tone. The prisoners have a little hope. They have more hope they did than they did when you came in this morning. And some of them uh, are burning with a little bit of anger. And you don't know what will happen, but you have made a difference in this moment here. And you are led onto this bus, and the guard is there, and he says, pass, work pass, beat, beat, get on the bus. Pass, work pass, beat, beat, get on the bus. He comes up to you. Pass, work pass, give me deception. He looks at you, trying to see if there's something off, but you don't look him in the eye and he loses interest and he says, you may get on the bus. And you pass in on that bus, and the bus makes its way out of Drancy, what was once uh, a high-rise full of the hopes and dreams of new architecture, now a place of horror. And you make your way, now it's sort of becoming sort of, it's probably now at this point in time, you were there for quite some time and had to do work, it's probably three or four in the afternoon. That's been a long day. And they move you out and they drop you off back in Montparnasse, uh, Montmartre, back in Montmartre, back at that little cafe. And Muriel, once the bus leaves and you're all left off, says, 10. 10. And I'm going to give her the paperwork back. Make sure that gets back into the proper hands right away. And she says, I will come by Brick Tops. Perfect. And she says, she looks at you with wonder. Like she wants to say something to you, but she doesn't know if she should. What is it? Not many people would be so brave to do what you did. I hope you found what you were looking for.
I think I did. And as those better, better than myself has said, uh, not sure if it's bravery or just stupidity. <laughs> hmm. Genius madness. They say artists are somehow both. Artists somehow know. <laughs> well, when you come by the, the club, um, I owe you a drink as well. And she, with this sort of platoon of women tired after a long day of hard labor and hard emotional labor, all begin to make their way home around three or four in the afternoon. And tell me, what does Sylvie do at this moment? She wants to go to find Ruth. Mm-hmm. In Montparnasse. You travel, you ask around, it's not that hard um, to sort of find this place. Um, and you find the home of uh, Nathaniel Gavreau and Ruth Gavreau now. That's a little house. Um, he is, uh, you can tell from the, from the sign that he is a professor. And you knock. And the door opens. And she is probably like 24. Uh, and she opens the door. Um, her husband is not currently at home. Um, he's at school. But, and she opens the door with a little bit of fear in her eyes, because at this point in time, you never know who's knocking on your door. And she sees a woman she's never seen before. Um, are you Ruth? Oui. May I come in? Of course. And she lets you in and she sort of looks out at the street just to make sure, um, since the great raid was only two days ago and nobody knows if there's going to be another one and she closes the door and you see this this home uh that is uh, full of books and there are uh, photographs of her with who you must assume is her husband uh, but also photographs of her younger with her parents with her grandparents uh just sort of like you, you can just sort of see um the evidence of a family and of a of a life of somebody who you know as a kid laughed and smiled uh and who clearly uh you see her in a graduation gown she must have gone to to university um and she brings you in and she says i i don't have i have tea oh no i i shouldn't be staying long um I I met your grandfather. What? It's been a long morning. I don't have details. Is he okay? I saw your grandfather. Where is he? Is he is have they let him go? No. He He said that you and your husband need to leave. But my husband has a job here and his mother's here. He's going to have more troubles than being out of a job if the both of you stay. You saw what happened when they came by and took people. It's not going to be limited to non-citizens for much longer. I don't know how I would leave. What if I told you that I could help get you out? Oh. 
What is my grandfather's name? You can tell me his name. Give me a fate point. All right, I feel like I could probably do that. <laughs> this is for these people's lives. Mm hmm. Israel. Do it. Mm hmm. His name is Israel. Israel. All right. This is passion for the cause. Mm hmm. It is. I need these. I need these people to survive. Mm hmm. His name is Israel, and he said that you were a very beautiful granddaughter. What? What do I have to go? What do I have to do? Meet me at Bricktops. <coughs> tonight what should I bring <coughs> bring everything you absolutely need in the smallest case that you have the smallest they're taking people they're stacking them on top of each other I have to wait for my husband to come home but will come promise me you will they're they've begun to kill people if you'll excuse me <clears throat> and you can see she starts to pack all right my and you can see her like looking at the photograph of her and her grandfather and her mm -hmm. grandmother he he told me to tell you that he loved you and that he, that he, not to worry about him and that he would be getting out. Should we wait for him? No. No, I don't think you should. My name is Sylvie, by the way. Oh, <clears throat> Ruth. But you know that. Yes. Um, yes. Find me later tonight at the club. Um, I will see that you get out. Okay. And you can tell this is like a lot for her. And you can also tell that she's got to figure out how to convince her husband to go. But That's fair. But you've told her. And I, where do you go from here? Do you go straight to the club? Do you go somewhere else? Um... She is going to, there is a spot she has. Mm -hmm. um, it is a little garden spot um, in the back areas of uh, Montmartre, in the windy streets up near the uh, Basilica. Um, Sacre-Cœur, kind of where you can overlook the city. Um, she's going to go there. I. She's going to go up there. She's going to find a spot where she can be alone, and she's going to start look, looking at the notes. And each one is a note of love or uh, reassurance or just letting someone know they were someone. There are notes of telling people to leave. There are notes telling people uh, that they are loved. Uh, there are dreams, there are hopes. There are notes that say uh, that there are some Jewish resistors and they should join them. There are notes saying to fight. There are notes saying that this will not last forever. There are notes saying uh, where they hid photo albums, their notes, all manner of messages uh, from, from large to small. And the messages all are in different hands, some uh, large and looping, some small and cramped, uh, some rushed, some you can't read because uh, they're in Polish, you just have names and addresses, but not the 
the containment is too is is too much. Some are in Russian, which you don't know at all. Uh, some are in are, are in uh, German, all different languages, and it's uh, all different hands and scripts, and it's all all of these notes of which there are many. They're all people, and some notes are just a list of the entire family that's there at Drancy, and what date they were there at, and where they were from, where their home was. Some of them are just sort of biographies in some ways, uh, markers of people. And you see a full range of, of sorrow, of hope, of denial, of resistance. And these are all people. And they're all people who um, live. And they're all people who are at this moment in what was once uh, a a high rise for families, and now a transit camp between here and some other place. You don't know what that place is, but it can't be good. Well. She is going to, with each one, read each single one individually, and then very carefully make stacks. So the ones with uh, a destination of any kind, she's going to put in one stack. The ones in a language she doesn't understand, she's going to put in other stacks. Um, and the ones that are just testaments to the writers and biographies and statements of having been she's going to put in a separate stack and those she's going to put on herself and just keep those on her and then where do you go um then i don't think she goes anywhere she stays there then I think she just waits. And she waits. And the lights, the sun goes down. The lights don't come up for fear of bombing and the city is dark. Just the sounds of people. You can see couples laughing as they walk down the street. Oblivious because they're young and they're in love. And they're still love, uh, even in a time like this and you have people with hopes and dreams people calling out things they're selling on the streets and you know that your club is probably spooling up at some point in time soon and the members of Bricktop's brigade are probably meeting at this club and in your heart you have the testament of all of those people to be remembered. And that is where we end our solo episode for this evening. So. I will let you know that this is a major milestone for Sylvie. It is. It is. Um, you, uh, in in fate, you can basically level up, you know, maybe every four or so episodes, but the solo episode is a major milestone for you. And this will allow you to increase the skill, but also if you want to, re to rewrite your high concept to be something a little bit different, if you think this has changed yourself a little bit. May have. May have. And you can think I, about it. I think she may have changed just a little. Mm-hmm. You can ponder it. So, first off, everybody in chat, all of you all, I want to thank you so much for being here and being here yes. with us uh, in this episode. I... I appreciated all the comments that were going by and all the support that you gave us. Thank you. Oh, uh, we just got some bits uh, from Rissa saying to Trooper and Fox, 
uh, for breaking our collective hearts. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, I know that some of you all were like, why would you offer her a fate point to leave Dimitri her love? <laughs> well, because they have trouble aspects. And that's a thing that is that's worth real. a fate point. That is real. That is real. And that is worth a fate point. Um, so um, I would love to ask you, my dearest Fox, who are you? Where can we find you, like, for example, on Sunday or other times? And <laughs> and give us give us uh, your decompress moment. Yes. Um I am Rocket Fox. I am, yes, I am also in a lot of feelings. <laughs> um, oh, that was so good. I I want to say thank you so much, Trooper. That is, what a journey. What a journey. Um, yeah, no, so I am Rocket Fox. You can find me all, all around. Uh, if you if you look for me and you look up Rocket Fox, like the Rockets, um, <laughs> that's, that's dancing. Um, you you will find me. Um, I'm on the Instagrams, Twitters. I don't use Twitter very well, but I'm on there. Um, and then I've been streaming as of late on my own channel, um, which brings me to where I can be found next. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn off our sad sad music right now. Just I'm going to turn off our sad music. Go on. Yeah, no, this is this doesn't call for sad music. No. This calls for upbeat music because normally I'm up Monday nights and Thursday afternoons. However. This upcoming Sunday afternoon, something exciting is going on because we're doing a virtual stage reading of Shakespeare's The Tempest with someone, Who? someone. Little Red Dot. Little Red Dot and Trooper. Whoa! Whoa! whoa both going to be in there. Um, so everyone here should be there on Sunday. It's, it's Shakespeare Sunday. It's going to be hype. Um, and actually, I'll, I'll share this too because I love everybody oh. so much. A sneaky peek, which sneak peek. I gave us. I gave a sneaky peek of mine before, but I'm gonna since we're on Trooper, since we're on your channel, I'm gonna give a sneaky peek of uh, of this. So I, there's also gonna be illustrations that I've done that are going to accompany, including. Um, so Trooper is going to be our Ariel, and this is the illustration of our Ariel. What? So so yeah, um, and that is gonna be Sunday at. 3.30 p.m. Central, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, which also makes that 2.30 p.m. Mountain and 1.30 p.m. Pacific. Holy moly. Yes. And then <laughs> also that makes it 9.30 p.m. BST? Oh, yes. British time? No, so that's, we, two of our cast members are in Cairo, Egypt. So that makes that actually 10.30 p.m. Cairo, seven hour difference. Um, and then there, yeah, and there's also going to be actual full, full illustrations for scenes and stuff. So it's going to be out of control. Oh, um, that's why, that's why Rocket Fox did not sleep last night. <laughs> that that beginning scene was real. I didn't sleep just because I was uh, working on uh, character backstories. That's why it's, you know, that's, that's how it is. Um, so give, give me a moment. Yes. Um, oh my God. That whole that whole stuff with Dimitri was just, just take my heart and rend it in two. Take it and like, take it and go. <laughs> <laughs> take uh, it, take another little piece of my heart now, baby. Yeah, yeah, take it and just wait, wait. This right here, take yeah. it and just, yeah. yeah. whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, that whole thing was just, I, well, well done. Well done. Well done, oh you. Oh, uh, Rissa says the rest of the cast is going to have so many feels when they finally get to watch this episode. They're, they're not going to want to. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be like, I don't want to. <laughs> uh, uh, chat was afraid Trooper was going to off Dimitri mid song. No, no. Yeah, I kind of didn't know it. Well, because. I did notice the roles keep happening. I was like, is that to see if he's going to die or not? Like, what? No, those <laughs> roles were to see when the gendarmerie decided to come and find out what you're up to. 
Oh my God! Thank goodness. No, thank that that they. I was praise be our in Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I was not rolling well for them. They were right. being distracted by people outside, and so they did not come to find you. But cool. here's the thing: I would not have him die mid song because then you don't have any hard choices. That's that is fair. That is fair. Dying is too easy. Dying is too easy. Instead, you have to know that, you know, he's in there. Uh, yeah. Riss <gasps> yeah. Rissa says, we were, now I hope he holds up to interrogation by Falk as replacement. Rissa, here's the thing. Regina burned and stole, stole and then burned all of those files. That's true. So Falka's replacement doesn't know about Dimitri or why he was brought there. Right. Well, and the other thing too, oh my God, immediately one of the things that crossed my mind too, he was like, oh, you know, um, maybe they'll forget about me. And I was like, you know, that you're here to feed you, water you, put you by the sun, let you grow and thrive. <laughs> Yeah. So all of those sorts of things. Yeah. He's very he's got a lot of consequences oh, on his body. Oh. Yeah. They cracked my little peanut. They did. They did. But but um but he's been given hope that he did not have before. Good. And I and I rolled okay on my empathy, so You did. You rolled okay enough on your empathy to help start that process. Yeah. And maybe that will be what he needs to keep going in this place. So uh, I'm, what a what a heart render, a tearjerker. That's your fault. Good. Good. <laughs> Feel it. Let that let those feel soak right in. If I have to suffer, so does everyone else. Uh, um and you used your boosts very well you're down to uh only three fate points as a group Good. Uh, you burned through five fate points this session huh well that's that's what everyone gets for, for letting me to my own devices <laughs> but you accomplished a mission it was not the one you started off with but it was the one that you thought was the most important in the end well and you know what this is good. Like we got some stuff out and like, honestly, as far as the bigger picture, I think as far as Sylvie is concerned, like this could be an opportunity to go in there and, and bust up some stuff. If everybody in there just rises up, well, maybe we can get everyone in there to rise up. And if we, if we get information out, to the people, maybe we get the people to rise up. I don't know. I'm just throwing, so I'm just spitballing here, but you know what? We just, you know, you know, I'm just saying. I'm you, al just... you also now know what the security is at the Drancy uh, camp. That's right. It's all our own people. We should be ashamed of ourselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go have some words with Michelle. <laughs> I will say, um, uh, I will say it's uh, somebody in chat asked, like, but wouldn't the Germans have been running it? The Germans did not run Drancy. The Germans had the, the French gendarmerie uh, run that camp. Uh, you know, it's important sometimes when you're occupying a place to make sure that people you're occupying also do the stuff. Uh, and, you know, you know, they were in there all right. Oh, it's like a job for lots of ammunitions. Yep. Or other such or things. Other such things. So, my friends, I am Trooper SJP. I, I have been your GM for this evening. Oh, by the way, uh, Coldrake notes the French cooperated for a couple of years before the Germans fully took over, and they did. Uh, and Levi says, dividing the people in place you're occupying makes your job easier, and that is also true. Um, mm -hmm. We need a title for this episode, and I think... I think it should be Dimitri. Oh. Unless you have another thought. Also, you, Chad, I see you over there. Yeah, Chad, throw, throw us a bomb, man. Mm-hmm. Like, Chad's smart. <laughs> um, oh, Songs in the Dark, Letters from Dimitri, oh, Little, Little Peanut. Peanut. 
I was going to say crushed peanut, but man, that's, peanut. that's a little aggressive. Blanket statements, little scraps of paper. Oh. Ooh, I love that one. Little scraps of paper. I, I kind of like that too, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Little scraps of hope. <laughs> little scraps of paper. That's well, our title. That. Yeah. You get the you get the 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 prize for today, uh, Crit Twitch. Little scraps of paper. Plus the uh, little sketch too, like. Cause that's a scrap of paper, right? It's like, mm-hmm. And she just glue it to her face. Just... This is me now. This is my face now. You know, and of course, uh, he would have loved to have kept it, but he wanted to give you something. She she would have. He, and here's the thing: there was that moment of like, I this is what you drew to have me around and I, I want you to keep it on that and because it mattered to you but realistically we both know you're not much longer for this world and I probably am more so and I really want this Yeah. and I want to have this to remember you and you want me to have this to remember you so yeah. I think we both agree that I should have this yep Thank you. <sighs> so uh, you can find me It's a it's a dense weekend for me Tomorrow is Saturday, is that true? It is, last I heard. That is correct. So tomorrow at 1 p.m. I'll be GMing A Good Society, um, the captain's table over on Roll For It, which will be part two of two, and it's on a boat, it's a ship, there'll be ships on a ship, and probably also shocking reveals. Um, and then on Sunday uh, at 1 p.m., I will be running. I will be playing in uh, Seraphim Station, which is Capers Offworld. It's a four-parter, and that's a brand new uh, game that is not yet even out. It's in Kickstarter. Uh, Capers, it's exciting. And then uh, at 4:30 on Rocket Fox, which is where Rocket Foxes are found, I will be being Ariel in the Tempest. Uh, Rocket, I don't know if you know about this. It's a thing that I'm doing. It's very cool. Uh, I I do I do. do In you? fact, let me hang on. Let me let me go ahead and and then. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if it will make you any more excited about this, um, I'm going to after we get done and I do my post show admin, which is like putting up the title and all that business. Um, you know, I'm going to go and work on my song compositions because I will be singing in this show <laughs> on Sunday. So if yeah! you miss some banjo times Yay! then you'll probably also want to be there on sunday and yes! yeah and so yeah there's going to be a little bit of a uh, uh, banjo plan on sunday so that's my big sunday and then you can catch me on wednesday at uh, over on little red dots channel for overlight nova and then i'll be playing some uh wander song again uh on thursday so that's that's my and oh and then friday you know of course more City of Light and Shadows. More City. What will happen? What will the ramifications be? And also, now we realize that Trooper is truly omnipotent. He is all around us at all times. <laughs> so, uh, and my my moment. I have to. I get to pick my moment because there are two of Ooh, us. Yes. I get to pick one. I think my moment is um, when you're sitting on the bench right there in the back gardens of Montmartre. And you put so carefully, put each two moments. That's one, right? That's my first one. And you put each of the letters in those stacks and the ones that are just uh, a testimony of people you kept close to your heart. Like that moment was for me so beautiful. And then um, the other thing that I thought, this was just a moment that I, I really loved, uh, was when you started speaking to them in Polish and you're broken Polish and everybody was like, here's our moment where we can get a word out. And there, that, there was a look on your face when they all started swarming you. You just had this look that was the most amazing look. It was a look of, pardon my language? Yeah. Oh shit. Like it was this, it was this like, like this sort of like all of a sudden this weight hit and it was beautiful acting on your part and it was it was wonderful i i loved well, it it's just, this is this has been amazing it's like all of them are always amazing this has also been a very powerful one so. um if he asks how many episodes for the series there are 
12 episodes, there are 12 group episodes and four solo episodes, so 16 total for this season, and that will basically take us to when I have to move. Uh, so we'll finish the season, I will move to Ithaca, and then, you know, I will have a discussion with the cast about how they're feeling, what if they've got time, what's going on for them. So for all I know, there may well be a season two, unless they all die, in which case oh. we... I mean, I don't know. I don't I know. Said literally. No, not you as players. I, like, oh, I, I meant your character. Okay. <laughs> no, Man, I meant that's, your that's characters. Much right. Your characters might, you know, I don't know, all die in a big fire. Because, oh, oh hey. Oh, snap. All right. I, I don't know what you're up to. You might be arsonists. Because here's the thing. In Call of Cthulhu, players burn everything down all the time. Uh, listen, if... if Hey, if the opportunity comes, so we might. Like, what's that? You know? <laughs> you know? Uh, if he's like, I thought Trooper said they would re-roll. Yes, they will re-roll. Uh, if, if their character... Let me put it this way. If their character dies or is indisposed for whatever reason, they may not be available, perhaps they're resting in a prison kind of place, uh, <laughs> then... The, <laughs> Maybe that player might want to bring in a secondary character until their primary character is less indisposed. They're lying down, really far down, like six feet down. For for example, for example. Um, all right. So this is us. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to thank you all for this journey. Uh, these things are super intense and I like it. And one of the questions was, will we have a solo episode next week? I don't know. Um, I'm going to ask the cast and find out what we're going to do next week. It might be solo. It might be a group episode. We will see. We will see how everybody's doing. Uh, but we'll find out. That said, um, take care, everybody. You all are yeah. wonderful. Thank you for being here. And thank you for all of your support. And I should say, because, uh, because I always forget, these are the socials if you want to join us. And... Um, we're going to go eat. We're going to go eat. That's what yeah. we're going to do. That is right. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye-bye now. Mm -hmm.